Good morning, everyone. My name is Stephen Scarrett Davis, and I serve as the executive director of the Maryland State Arts Council. Um, I'm going to uh, two quick notes before we get started uh, to ensure an equitable process. Uh, we will be using a script to guide today's panel meeting, so there may be a high level of formality in our presentation. Uh, the interest is equity here, and also please note that our meeting is being recorded. Panelists, I want to thank you for being here and for your service to the arts communities of Maryland. To begin, we'll do a reference shot of the platform that we're using today, the features for Google Meet. Please note the mute button, the microphone icon, and the video button, the camera icon, at the bottom of your screen on the left-hand side. Panelists, to avoid any background noise, we ask that you remain on mute during the meeting unless you are speaking. Additionally, we ask that all comments regarding applica applicants or applications be vocalized and to please refrain from using the chat feature, um, which is in the bottom right hand side. Are there any questions about using Google Meet? I'm seeing head shaking, no questions. All right. Next, we will go through some introductions. I'll start by introducing the MSAC uh, team members and our roles during today's meeting. I've already introduced myself, and my role beyond the introduction this morning is monitoring today's meeting. Also monitoring the process are Maryland State Arts Counselors, Bonnie Fogel and Shelley Morheim. Thank you both for being here. Uh, Laura Weiss, Program Director for Art Services, is serving as the Staff Discipline Expert for Theater in the Grants for Organizations Program. She has reviewed the applications we'll review today. And Kathy Teixeira, Grants Director, will be serving as the Panel Facilitator and Averaging Final Scores. Tammy Opal, Grants Management Associate, will be our timekeeper and provide technical support throughout today's meeting. And Emily Sollenberg, the other Program Director for Art Services, will also be assisting throughout the meeting today. Panelists, I'm now going to ask that you introduce yourselves by name and art form. Uh, Laura will say your name for your introduction, and please be sure to unmute yourself before speaking. Laura? Thank you so much, Stephen, and good morning, panelists. Thank you so much for being here. We're really excited to have you today. Um, I'm just gonna go across my screen. Um, if you could just say your name and just a, a very brief introduction. Um, Pam, you're first. Hi, I'm Pam Roberts. My discipline is theater, and um, I'm primarily a, a fundraiser and grant writer in theater. Thanks, Pam. Amanda. Hi, I'm Amanda Moshak, she, her. Um, I am uh, from the theater discipline, uh, but I work with a local community orchestra. Thanks so much, Amanda. And David. Hi, David Cantor, he, him. Uh, I am a donor services officer at the Baltimore Community Foundation. My training was in theater with a focus in stage management. Thanks, David. And Vicki. Hi, good morning. I'm Vicki L. Jones, um, theater discipline, clothing, and costume design. Thank you so much. Stephen, back over to you. <laughs> Thanks, Laura. Thank you, panelists. Um, it's great to have you here today. Thank you for all of the work that you've done up to today. And thank you for uh, everything that you will do today. I'm really looking forward to the discussion. Uh, we are now going to move through MSAC's guiding documents. Uh, these are meant to ground us in our values in, um, and remind us of uh, the work of MSAC. I'm going to start with reading, and I'll read all of these for accessibility purposes, but I'll start with the land acknowledgement statement. This was developed in consultation with tribal leaders from across the state of Maryland, and this is the, um, the statewide land acknowledgement statement that was part of our land acknowledgement project. We acknowledge the lands and waters now known as Maryland are the home of its first peoples, the Akahanic Indian tribe, Assateague Peoples tribe, Cedarville Band of Piscataway Indians, Choptico Band of Indians, the Nape Tribe, Nanticoke Tribe, Nasu Waywash Band of Indians, Piscataway Kanoi Tribe, Piscataway Indian Nation, Pocomoke Indian Nation, Susquehannock Indians, Yakagani River Band of Shawnee, and tribes in the Chesapeake watershed who have seemingly vanished since the coming of colonialism. We acknowledge that this land is now home to other tribal peoples living here in diaspora. We acknowledge the forced removal of many from the lands and waterways that nurtured them as kin. We acknowledge the degradation that continues to be wrought on the land and waters in pursuit of resources. We acknowledge the right 
of the land and waterways to heal so that they can continue to provide food and medicine for all. We acknowledge that it is our collective obligation to pursue policies and practices that respect the land and waters so that our reciprocal relationship with them can be fully restored. There's more about our land acknowledgement project on our website, msac.org, under resources. Our next grounding document is our equity and justice statement. The arts celebrate our state's diversity, connect our shared humanity, and transform individuals and communities. The Maryland the Arts Council and its supporting collaborators are committed to advancing and modeling equity, diversity, accessibility, and inclusion in all aspects of our organizations and across communities of our state. MSAC and its grantees are committed to embracing equity and non-discrimination regardless of race, religious creed, color, age, gender expression, sexual orientation, class, language, and or ability. The vision of the Maryland State Arts Council is that uh, the Maryland State Arts Council plays an essential role, ensuring that every person has access to the transformative power of the arts. And our mission is to advance the arts in our state by providing leadership that champions creative expression, diverse programming, equitable access, lifelong learning, and the arts as a celebrated contributor to the quality of life for all the people of Maryland. In 2019, we adopted a strategic plan to help us move toward that vision and accomplish that goal, or ex accomplish our, mis our, our mission. Uh, these five goals, I'll read the bolded portions. Uh, there's more information on our website, msac.org, in the About section under Strategic Plan. Goal one, increase participation. Goal two, provide intentional support. Goal three, build capacity. Goal four, leverage connections. And goal five, bolster Maryland arts. In all of our public meetings, we share these creative meeting actions as reminders of ways that we can be in the space together. Uh, they're really guardrails on our conversation um, and to, um, to help us, uh, again, be in the space together. I am going to ask the panelists to unmute and uh, read these off in turn. So I'll start with the first one, and then I'll ask, a or I, I, I'd like a panelist to volunteer uh, to come off mute and read the second one, uh, another panelist to read the third one, and on. I, with the number of panelists and the number of creative meeting actions, uh, you'll be unmuting and, and reading more than one. Uh, but we will go ahead and get started. I will start with the first one. Celebrate being in the space with other creative people. Engage with everyone's presence as a gift. Acknowledge that together we know a lot. Enter the conversation with curiosity and inquiry. Share your idea and trust that it will be heard. Use I statements. Focus your language on the task at hand. Hold one another accountable with care. Apply yes and, and I hear your idea and I'm going to add to it. Balance speaking and listening. Oh, this is going to be a good group. That was great. Thank you, panelists. <laughs> um, next, we'll review uh, our grant making um, uh, philosophy here uh, in, in how, uh, how we think about equity um, as impact versus grant writing. The application for grants for organizations is meant to inspire authentic reflection and internal analysis for each applying organization with the knowledge that the Maryland State Arts Council is to be seen and utilized as a collaborative partner in the process. One aspect of the partnership is to guide panelists to see beyond the polish of grant writing that may be inequitably influenced by privilege of resources, financial, educational, or otherwise, and instead to focus on the impact of the applicant. Further information on driving goals for the grant making process are detailed within the application, which can be found on msac.org. And one last thing, panelists, we ask that throughout today's meeting that you frame your responses as recommendations. For example, uh, as uh, is on the slide, the comment, the strategic plan was unclear and did not speak to the organization's mission and goals. 
As a recommendation that becomes, I would recommend that the organization clarifies the strategic plan by adding language that connects directly to the mission, vision, and goals. So a bit of a reframing there. And really, it's in the interest of uh, providing this feedback to applicants. Applicants are able to request feedback, um, and we, uh, we, we, we provide that feedback, not attributed to any of the panelists, but as recommendations to improve applications and to um, support their, their goals and their mission going forward. We are going to move forward with further instructions um, and, goal, and goals just shortly. Are there any questions so far about anything that I've shared regarding the role of the panelist or our guiding documents? All right, hearing nothing. Um, I'm glad that that's clear, and I'm going to now hand it over to Kathy to share it to lead us through the next part of the introduction. Take it away, Kathy. Thanks, Stephen. The goal of today is to arrive at an average panel score for 23 applications in the theater discipline. Please note for those observing that this panel meeting is not the full panel review process. Comprehensive application reviews and initial scores have been submitted by the panelists prior to today's meeting. Today is an opportunity for the panel to hear additional information gathered from panelists who conducted the in-depth conversations and artistic activity visits. Panelists will be able to add to or edit their initial reviews and submit final scores based on discussions held today. The final average score determined today will be included in the funding formula used to determine grant amount recommendations. Also a reminder to panelists that this is not a comparative process. Each application should be evaluated individually based on the rubric provided. So any comparison content between applications should not influence your score. Next, um, on the screen, you'll see a breakdown of the time allotted for each application's review. Uh, this process mirrors the panel process of the National Endowment for the Arts. And with MSAC's commitment to equity in the panel process, it requires anonymity of specific panel scores. So the initial and final scores shared today are the averages from all panelist scores. So we'll start by sharing a slide of the grant application's initial average score. The panelist who conducted the artistic activity uh, will speak first, followed by the panelist who held the in-depth conversation. Each will have two minutes, and our timekeeper today, Tammy, will chime in at the end of each two-minute mark. Then we'll open it up for additional discussion with all panelists for four minutes. Tammy will again alert us at the four-minute mark. Then I will ask staff discipline expert Laura to contribute any additional thoughts based on her analysis of the application. Her contributions are intended to ensure that recommendations are in alignment with MSAC's commitment to equity, justice, and procedural transparency. Then panelists will be provided three minutes to submit their final scores and comments in Smart Simple. Panelists, we ask that you wait to submit your scores until after the discussion period has concluded. Um, please note that any identified conflicts of interest will be announced prior to an application's review. Panelists, if you have a conflict of interest that we don't already recognize, please announce yourself at the beginning of that application review. And those with conflicts will not be participating in the discussions and scoring of that particular application. Finally, I'd like to mention that we will be taking breaks regularly throughout the day. All right, before we move on, are there any questions regarding the panel meeting structure? <clears throat> yes, I, I'm one of the panelists with the conflict. Can I stay on the screen or do I need to physically remove myself? So you can you can stay on the call. Uh, we would recommend that you just turn your video and mic off. Will do, thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions? Um, I have a question. Can you keep the um, the the information from Smart Simple up during the time when the artistic activity panelists and the in depth conversation panelists are talking and we're having a discussion, um, or are you only allowed to open that in the final three minutes? 
Oh yeah, no, you can definitely have it open. So actually um, we're gonna go through the script in a minute, but at the top of the review, I'm gonna say panelists, please open application number, you know, whatever. Um, so you can definitely have it open um, and you can definitely be kind of browsing your notes and the application as well while folks are speaking to kind of help jog your memory on what kind of comments or questions that you might have had that you want to discuss. All right, great questions. Anyone else? All right, uh, just a quick reminder uh, for our counselors and all guests joining us today that you may not participate verbally or in the chat box. Your role today is as observer only, so please be sure to remain on mute and please turn your cameras off as well. Um, and a reminder for panelists to also stay on mute unless you're speaking. Um, this really helps to eliminate any background noise. All right, we're gonna get started with a uh, practice round using a test application. So panelists, you should be logged into your Smart Simple account and on your panelist home screen, you'll see today's nominations under the pending final review section. So please go ahead and click that. And if you click on the organization header at the top of the screen, that will sort the list by organization name. So it's out in alphabetical order. And this is the order we're going to go in today. And just a, a trick is that the small arrow to the right of the organization should be pointing up. And the first application that appears is a test application. The organization name is One Maryland State Arts Council. Following that, the next application you should be seeing is for fluid movement, uh, number 2024-18772. Um, and then so on and so forth al alphabetically. So I'll give you a moment to just sort your applications and make sure that all looks right for you. Just let me know if you have any questions or need help with that. All right, and then <clears throat> just as you did at home, you're gonna be able to click on the open uh, button on the right hand side for each application and this is going to pull up the scoring rubric and also the application which will appear as a pop-up when you click on the application summary button. For our practice round please go ahead and open application-23656 for the Maryland State Arts Council. If this were a real application, you would see your initial scores and notes here. Um, since this is a test application, the, the rubric's gonna appear totally blank. Um, and we're gonna walk through what the process would look like if this were a real review. So I'm gonna talk through the actual script that we're gonna be using for reviews today. So panelists, please open test application-23656, the mock average score from round one of reviews is 85%. The panelists that attended the artistic activity visit will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. And this is where that panelist would have two minutes to speak. Then the panelists that held the in-depth conversation will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. And then that panelist would speak for two minutes. Then I will open it up to all. In the real review period, you would now have four minutes for discussion. This period is to be used for sharing additional recommendations, information that may bring a different perspective to what has already been stated, or to ask questions of the artistic, acti artistic activity visit and in-depth conversation panelists. If either of the lead panelists did not complete their remarks and were cut off at the two minute mark, they would be welcome to complete their thoughts during that four minute period. So if you do get cut off, don't worry, you can finish your sentence or thought at that time. After the discussion period, I would turn to Laura. As a staff discipline expert, do you have any additional information to share? This is where Laura would chime in with anything additional. Then finally, I would say, based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to submit your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. So panelists, we'll actually take some time out for you to actually submit scores for this test application. So we have an opportunity to make sure everything's working properly on our end. We can see your scores coming in. Um, so for this test application, please go ahead and just make a selection of any score in the dropdowns for each question. 
no need to add any notes or anything, just make a selection on the score. Um, and then once you're through, click on complete at the bottom. So we'll give you a moment to do that right now. <clears throat> And the average final score is 87%. So thank you, panelists. I saw all of your scores come through. So thanks for testing that out with us. This is the way that each application review is going to flow. Do you have any questions about this process? <clears throat> all right. If not, let's get started. So panelists, please make sure you're back at your uh, panelist home screen, pending final review section, and ensure that your list is sorted alphabetically by clicking on the organization header. First up, please open application from fluid movement, application ID 2024-18772. The average initial score is 79%. The panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, Vicki, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Uh, good morning. I was invited to a 1 p.m. rehearsal for a performance that uh, I was told was going to be filmed in the coming days. I arrived at 1245, um, waiting for someone in, to arrive. At 1 p.m., I went inside and was directed into the pool area. Uh, I was waiting for some members to arrive, and finally, Ashley Ball came. Uh, Ashley told me that there would be a group of 19 swimmers that day and that they would be divided into two groups to rehearse. Uh, she told me I would see one group doing synchronized swimming and another doing various exercises. I took a seat in the upstairs level. The group continued to chat and did warm ups. Um, and at, eventually, they entered the pool. I watched for some time as two groups of swimmers did various routines. It wasn't clear if this was an actual performance, if there was a director. There were no technical directions being given. And it did not seem to be a final rehearsal. Um, the, as regards the water ballet component of their activities, based on what I saw, swimmers were learning and were engaged in that discipline. Uh, the group was having fun, but from my observation that day, it seemed that fluid movement operates more as a swim club that gives performances rather than a theatrical company which uses water as its medium. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, Amanda, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. 
Water ballet is theater through the medium of synchronized swimming. Sometimes the ballets have more intricate storylines and sometimes they are more like variety shows. For the creative process, there's a pitch party where anyone can pitch an idea and have creative input with some tweaks from the artistic director. The board votes and approves the script. Signups are first come first served and anyone can be in it. Directors and choreographers are inclusive and flexible with the idea that fluidity means also meeting people where they are and where their abilities are. Participants can always give input during the process and it is a collaborative effort. The roller skating creative process is the same, just on skates. Regarding board diversity, fluid movement is engaging with constituents and is now encouraging them to join, not just waiting for people to come to the board, and they have brought on a woman of color. Their board represents diverse socioeconomic backgrounds, areas of Baltimore, and skill sets. Their brand new board president, as of January 1st, is working on a plan. For staffing structure, it is much more linear than the chart indicated. The board is led by officers and is directly above the artistic director, who is then in charge of community outreach coordinator handling small gigs. That person oversees volunteers. As for strategic planning and the future, growth includes growing the board and the volunteer base. Currently, they have six board members, but can have up to 15. They have changed the website to be more than just a showcase of their programs and now has easy volunteer forms to increase the number of volunteers. They cannot really grow the audience much because bleachers at city pools limit capacity. They assess water ballet program effectiveness with two surveys, one for audience feedback and one for anyone who has participated. They use the assessment and a post-mortem meeting to gauge what worked and what did not, which directly impacts the next programming. Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. I had a question for the, to the, to the extension of Simon. Can you speak any further to sort of how dom non-dominant narrative standards and aesthetics uh, showed up in your conversations or in your visits and how they're uh, regularly considered by the organization? Um, I could go. Um, I know that when I spoke to uh, the organization, they said that they often have uh, people with disabilities and that, that are collaboratively involved in what they're working on and in the cast of, uh, of the different swimmers and things. And um, they have uh, a lot of input um, based on whatever their ability set is. Um, so if that person cannot stand or if that person uh, needs a step stool or if that person has, you know, certain limitations or certain needs that they always incorporate those sorts of things. The storylines vary from year to year, so I'm not particularly sure how, um, I, I know one of them had to do with like space programs or something. And so it, it, I think that um, they take into consideration where the people are um, and that that seems to be more important than the narrative. Sure. Thank you. I'd like to add that um, their grant talked uh, about engaging more people of diverse backgrounds. And it was interesting to me that they uh, trained at Callow Hill Swim Center, which is a very well um, known and respected swim club where a lot of um, black and people of color have gone through um, swim training. And there was a, a swim class going on there and I noticed the dynamics of when the group came into the building. Um, all of the staff were African Americans. All of the lifeguards were African Americans, and there wasn't any "Hey, how you doing? Hey, whatever." You know, as if they had integrated into that space, which was in the Pimlico area. It just it it, it seemed like they came in to do their thing, and there was no interaction. And so, when they say they have difficulty with finding board members of people of color, I just wonder if they've reached out just to the staff and the lifeguards and the people who are right there and and if they want to diversify their troop, I'm not sure if you know what what that is, but there were two groups of swimmers there who were doing dynamic swimming things. So I just wonder how much they have integrated into that space um, in order to to address that diversity issue. Thank you, Nikki.
panelists, are there additional thoughts, recommendations, comments to share? If not, Laura, as a staff discipline expert, do you have any additional information to share? Yeah, thank you so much, panelists. Um, you really hit on pretty much all of my notes, so I'm going to be rather brief um, with this. But um, I, you know, I just something that really stood out in the application um, was the ways in which the organization is um, working with the community to establish uh, feedback and input. Um, the pitch parties was something that um, I, I noticed in the application, and Amanda mentioned that as well. Um, they also talked about partnerships with other nonprofits as part of the decision making process. So there seems to be a real commitment there to um, looking for you know that that input and feedback from the community at large. Um, they did mention that board recruitment and retainment is a challenge and rising expenses is another challenge. And those are absolutely very, very real, uh, you know, things that organization uh, can be facing. Um, you know, they might consider um, steps and plans in some kind of long term or strategic plan to address some of these um, these challenges that they're facing. Um, so that might be something to consider in the in the near future that, you know, idea of some kind of long term plan. Um, it, it does appear to be a very highly collaborative um, group. I thought something else that was very unique was the idea of that there are no auditions. And I think that that is uh, supported through the ideas that were, the panelists discussed that um, the organization is really meeting the performers with where they are, um, you know, having, uh, you know, different ability levels and making sure that everybody's comfortable in the storytelling. Um, so I just encourage them to keep keep digging deeper into that. Um, and I think that's everything. Thanks so much. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click Complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now. And panelists, as we calculate this final score, please, uh, you can go ahead and gather your notes in preparation for the next organization.
and the average final score is 79%. Next, please open application from Flying V, application ID 2024-18769. The average initial score is 96%. The panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, Pam, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Flying V is a performing arts organization that creates niche-based art within three wings, theater, fights, and research and development. Their work spans audio drama, interactive digital storytelling, traditional theater, stage combat, professional wrestling, and arts education. Flying V's wings are unified by using a pop culture and modern mythology rubric to explore areas of imagination, and they embrace the moniker nerd theater. I had an in-person conversation with the executive director supplemented by videos and clips of representative artistic activities. I listened to a selection from Paperless Pulp, their podcast series that was born out of Flying V's wealth of playwrights as a way of letting them stretch their muscles and explore issues and themes that might not be possible on stage or unwieldy for an organization of Flying V's size. I saw video excerpts of a recent workshop production of Vanishing Girl. The workshop was designed to move Hope Villanueva and Bill Yannick's musical forward to a fully produced work. Here, actors read the script and performed the songs in context in front of an audience. The piece was written by a local BIPOC playwright featuring an LGBTQ heroine in a comic book genre. And Flying V sees this production as an important way to engage new audiences and advance a promising work. I also um, watched Flying V's Fights trailer um, and a video that Flying V made for Synetic Theater's Digital Music Festival, Movement Festival in 2020. Uh, it was written and animated by one of the artistic co-leads for the fight department. And through that, I better understood their intent to blend the excitement of physical stage combat with the emotional experience of theater. So my experience ex supported what I saw in the application. It can be a challenge, I think, on paper to understand their niche art forms, um, but experiencing the selections gave me a deep understanding of their aesthetic and of their values. And in all of the selections, the art was smart, it was unique, it was thought provoking and really artistically challenging. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, Pam, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Flying V embraces a mindful out of the box thinking in its organizational planning as much as it does in its artistry. It proudly states it's a small theater and it's nimble. The artistic leads oversee each of the three artistic wings, that's theater fights and research and development. And the position of fight leads is shared by two people. So there's four artistic leaders in three roles. Board management and artistic leads are all term limited, although some of the roles will have an opportunity to renew for this cohort because of COVID interruptions. They don't want an organization that's identified long term with any one person's aesthetic. Not all of the terms expire at the same time. They want to retain their institutional knowledge. There's rolling annual renewals for the artistic wings, and they'll start a search seven months out so that the artistic leads can shadow their predecessor and be part of the upcoming leadership meetings. Flying V's institutional planning intentionally doesn't look beyond three to five years. There will always be someone who was there when a decision was made and there'll be somebody, you know, decisions implemented after someone's gone. Their definitions of success aren't necessarily growth or acquiring space. They say these are the types of issues that define longer strategic planning that stretches into a decade. But they recognize that a new team later might evolve to think of something different and they're open to that. Flying V's biggest challenge isn't how much money it has, but it's cash flow. Pro, uh, programming and cash and, and grant payments aren't in sync. So a lot of their season planning and other organizational decisions are done with an eye to this cash flow. Flying V partners with three to four organizations or arts um, or artists annually. They're looking for lesser resourced and like-minded organizations who would benefit from flying V's resources like their infrastructure of ticketing or marketing support, or that they can hire an equity performer, which an individual cannot do. Um, they assess whether they can move a promising artistic effort to the next level by working together. Flying V would say that change and flexibility is a feature and not a bug. Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. I really enjoy getting to read this application. My one recommendation for Flying V would be to keep thinking about how to reach yet to be known constituents, keep building out those plans, developing that. Uh, I, I really appreciate the framing in the application that 
this, these programs can feel niche, but uh, finding the people with whom they're going to connect is going to be the key to the long-term success that I think has been identified um, as a real priority for the organization going forward. Thank you. Panelists, are there any other questions, recommendations, comments to share? If not, Laura, as a staff discipline expert, do you have any additional information to share? Um, Amanda, did you have something? I, I saw your hand go up. Yeah, I was trying are to, I, I was getting to the, um, the part in smart simple where i could bring up the staffing chart um sorry it was a little like a lot of clicking um but uh is there any clarity on who specifically manages or oversees the different artists and volunteers or does each uh artistic lead handle them individually for their discipline it's my understanding it's by the by the artistic leads and yes because the the different disciplines have different um different needs they you know they're fairly yeah i think it's within the artistic leads about my response it's an unconventional structure no doubt but i understand how it's designed to work and where each person has autonomy over their sort of work and where there's interdependence, where they work together across the organization, uh, across different programs and strategies. Panelists, anything additional to share? Please feel free to chime in. <clears throat> All right, sounds like not. So Laura, as a staff discipline expert, do you have any additional information to share? Um, panelists, the, your your notes uh, and comments were really in alignment with mine as well. So again, we'll be uh, rather brief, but I, I wanted to just uh, uplift a couple of points here. Um, I, I thought that this was a really clear written application and your comments added even more to to that understanding. Um, it, I, I found that it had a very uh, open and collaborative decision making process, um, you know, showing that those ideas that like Pam was talking about with working with other organizations as part of that process um, has become really important to them recently. Um, I think that they've worked really hard to implement this new staffing structure and that new model um, eliminated the unneeded stress um, and unsustainable reliance on one paid management position. So it seems like there were some really thoughtful changes to shift things like required hours and the corresponding payment that was associated with that. Um, I think there, there was a really clear discussion of their financial procedures and oversight. Um, and also a really clear awareness of how their board and staff reflect their communities in two different ways, looking at Bethesda versus Silver Spring. Um, and finally, I just think that the organization by the nature of its programming is really challenging the quote unquote norm in the definition of theater. They're pushing the envelope um, with thinking about things like those theatrical podcasts, the theatrical gaming and wrestling within its program. Um, within its programming. So I just encourage the organization to, to keep going with all of that. Thank you so much. 
Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now. And the average final score is 98%. Next up, please open application from Hippodrome Foundation, application ID 2024-17863. The average initial score is 83%. The panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, Vicki, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. I was invited by Olive Waxter, the executive director of the foundation, to attend a session of their Career Pathways program. Pathways introduces high school students to theater industry jobs. I sat in on a technical theater lighting class, which was taught by IATSE member Daniela Marks. Seven Coppin Academy high school students were learning to hang lighting instruments and to program basic lighting cues into the console. Students were on the stage, on the fly floor and in the booth and everyone was engaged and having a great time as was I because they had me interact with them and it was fun. I had an opportunity to speak with their cop and teacher. She loves the partnership as do her students. Um, the their program also includes a fashion a costume design class which is in progress where students are redesigning costumes for the musical six and they will be wearing those designs in the lobby on one of the performance dates i'll have shared that this is one of the only programs where students train in an equity theater work on professional equipment and are taught by union professionals and some of their former students have been able to join the union the program was clear, had a clear focus and has already achieved its goals. And I think it was just a great, a really great experience to see what they're doing. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, Pam, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. 
To bring a Broadway series to Baltimore, the Hippodrome Foundation is joined by the state-owned Franz Merrick Performing Arts Center and the commercial Broadway Across America. So Hippodrome in the state hired a for-profit operator, Broadway Across America, to operate the theater, present the season, sell tickets, oversee rentals, negotiate contracts. The Hippodrome is involved in presenting, catering, and then the community and educational outreach components. Hippodrome prevent, provides curricular materials through a lot of the study guides prepared by Broadway America, Across America for their shows. They host Camp Hippodrome, a free summer camp that gives students a chance to be at the theater and work for a week at the theater camp. There are two of them, um, free one-week sessions, which cap out at 80 people, first come, first served. There's also several one-day sessions. They offer a day specifically for seniors. They work with Kennedy Krieger to serve patrons with disabilities. Um, they offer book-based programs that are often linked to a fairy tale production, like this year's Frozen. Um, HPI offers master classes with Broadway casts, and during COVID, they offered about 100 virtual master classes as a way to help teachers and provide a paid opportunity for then unemployed actors. The grant narrative spoke of the renovation of an unused space that will be devoted to the community. The space will open very soon as the M&T Bank Exchange, a venue serving 500 to 600 people for community usage. They see this venue as an artistic launching pad. They're unsure now who the patrons will be, but they're aiming for diverse audiences who haven't set foot in the theater before. Um, the Hippodrome will soon develop a long range strategic plan and staffing plan. Previously, they were operating under the feasibility study for the new space and that was guiding all their work. But as they look ahead, they anticipate that they'll need to beef up education, grants and development. Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. Yeah, let me just have a follow-up question on what you were saying about the expansion. Can you go into a little more depth and sort of what their plans are for that space in terms of their commitment to equity, diversity, and inclusion, and what sort of the programmatic connection to their mission and goals in renovating that space was, please? The space was one of three that needed to be purchased by the state to create the uh, large enough venue for, for a Broadway house. And so it had been in disuse, they were able to raise the, the funding. And so it's a large, flexible, open space. They have a feasibility study, but it sounds very much like if you build it, they will come, that they're still finding out who the audience would be. They're finding out um, what would work best in the, in the flexible space. They were thoughtful about the capacity that that seemed to be um, uh, an underserved, uh, there were there were houses, much many more houses, bigger and smaller, but, um, but not in that space. Also, the Lexington Market uh, is uh, renovating across the street, and they'll think they think there'll be a lot more back and forth um, and energy in the, the neighborhood, given um, both of them opening roughly at the same time. Thank you, Pam. I guess my, my recommendation then would be continue to think about sort of the, the plans to reach constituents yet to be uh, reach, and be, be really cognizant of sort of how equity, diversity, inclusion can be actual, actualized um, and will serve what tangible strategies that they can continue to be attentive to, to uh, reach those goals that they could uh, state the commitment to. I'll note as I go through my um, my notes, Vicki, it was really helpful to hear about the um, the artistic work and the hands-on nature and how engaged the students were. Um, I would suggest that the or organization pull that out a lot more. And I did also get to see some of the costume renderings and such as part of my conversation. Um, and I and um, I would love for that to become more alive on the page. Um, it, it is helpful to have the supplemental um, information to augment what was in the narrative. Yes. I I'm you know I'm I wasn't aware that that there was so much going on with Papa and with the students like that. So, you know, I was I was really shocked at how well they're doing it and how people don't know about that. 
Um, I have a question about, uh, I know that um, Vicky said that she uh, attended something that was a class and it was directly linked to the IATSE um, uh, union uh, for theater trade workers. Um, was there any mentioning, Pam, in your conversation with them about uh, whether for Broadway across America, whether the shows that are coming in are equity tours versus non-equity tours? Um, I was just curious if they happen to mention anything about that. I didn't bring it up. I'm sorry. Yeah, I don't know. No, I, I didn't know if it happened to come up in conversation. Equity meaning the the professional organi organization for actors and stage management versus the non-equity tours that sometimes circulate. Absolutely. Understanding that both kinds of tours have been coming through the Hippodrome, I'd be curious, it wasn't really addressing the application, if there's a difference between sort of the availability of actors and availability of other personnel from the tours based on their union status. It sounds like for both kinds of tours, they're able to uh, really leverage those artists and sort of the, their talents to be able to provide those to, I guess, the students. Um, I agree. Thank you, panelists. That's four minutes. Thank you. Laura, as a staff discipline expert, do you have any additional information to share? Yeah, thank you so much, panelists. Um, really, really great observations there. Um, just a few things to add, um, and I think, Pam, you uh, you alluded to this as well. Um, the pandemic really caused the Hippodrome to change the mode in which they deliver their educational material, and they had a very positive response to that virtual programming. Um, it actually allowed for them to have a further reach across the state. Um, so I, I would encourage them to, con you know, continue with that exploration, um, you know, and, and how that's um, going to continue. Um, they also, they experienced um, a positive out of the pandemic uh, for them was that it actually resulted in a more engaged board uh, is what they reported in their application. Um, so that was a, a positive thing to come out of the past couple of years. Um, their creative process is a, is a big one and has national components that are involved in it. Um, I would encourage them to, um, to you know, think a bit further or, or elaborate a bit further in the, the application about the, uh, the local parts of that and how they're developing those relationships with specific schools, um, thinking about how does a school become involved with the programming that they offer for youth. Um, uh, I think just knowing a bit more about that process and, and what that uh, that planning process involves might be uh, helpful to know and to think about. Um, and I think, you know, as, as was discussed by the panelists, forward thinking to that new space that um, that's going to be opening very shortly, which Pam spoke about, um, there seems to be more opportunity for more experimental formats and further exploration of non-dominant um, voices and norms and programming options, and also new opportunities to engage with new audiences. Um, so that will be an exciting thing to see in the very near future. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now.
Thank you, panelists. That's three minutes. Pam, we're just waiting on your score. If you want to just finalize that and send it. I'm sorry. sorry. I, did it get received? Because I, I sent it. Okay, let me just check. Yep, I see it. Thank you. And the average final score is 83%. Next, please open application from Imagination Stage, application ID 2024-18612. The average initial score is 95%. Pam has stated a conflict of interest, so Pam will not be participating in the discussion and scoring. The panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, David, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Thank you, Kathy. I spent the morning at Imagination Stage in Montgomery County, where third graders attended Hula Hoop and Queen as part of the Learning Through Theater program. The morning began with a pre-show workshop featuring a teaching artist and performer, giving an interactive presentation relating to the key themes of the show, enabling the young participants to make noise, move about, and think critically about the world of the play they were about to see. This prepared them for a show created to connect directly to their social studies classroom curriculum, using historically grounded and multidisciplinary approaches to convey the diversity of the human experience. At the same time, children under six were attending a performance in Imagination Stages Theater for the Very Young program entitled Wake Up Brother Bear, which featured a live musician and two performers who invited the children to explore nature through touch and sound. The show activated the imagination of the youngest children through a sensory focused experience with participation as they wish. Meanwhile, rehearsals were also underway for Oyama the Beautiful, which is intended for older children and centered on undocumented youth based on real life experiences shared by young people in their theater for change workshops. This show seeks to build understanding for young people facing significant obstacles and inform audiences about the trauma that undocumented students can experience. By bringing the show on tour, it'll be presented to students in schools and locations across the county, regardless of their ability to come to the theater in Bethesda. I mean, evidently, Imagination Stage has many different programs which have been impressively refined and expanded as they've demonstrated their effective impact on the young people they serve throughout the community. And as demand for that, the need for the work has really increased. Imagination Stage has meeting the moment for children of all ages and backgrounds by creating professional, diverse, and exciting theatrical offerings. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, Vicki, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Uh, I met with Jason Najum, the managing director, uh, Janet Stafford, the founding artistic director, and two other of their artistic directors. One of the main questions from the panel was, how would the theater address an unexpected large expense? And I asked how their newly appointed director of finance would respond to that. Um, as it turns out, the director of finance declined that position shortly before he was to begin. And Jason acknowledged that a new search may be a challenge, but in the meantime, he has experience with finances and staff has biweekly calls and discussions regarding the financials. Um, Jason says that they practice serious stewardship of funds and government funding has provided a cushion they have little wiggle room. However, they do have six months working capital. Um, I asked how they had achieved the goal of providing the higher compensation earlier than projected in the grant. And uh, Jason's human resource background was instrumental in his ability to use data-driven research to develop and implement the plan, which let them increase salaries, uh, the increase is as high as 30 to 40% for what were lower salaries and three to 4% for higher salaries. 
Uh, Janet Stafford, who's the founding artistic director, added that Jason has been instrumental in making important and successful changes, and he has increased morale. There's total involvement between community volunteers who work at the theater and volunteers working in other areas such as dramaturgy and props and, and um, costumes. Their staffing structure has been successful because it's based on reciprocal relationships. He said that there's fair work, fair pay, and opportunities for part-time to full-time. Um, the creative risks include rethinking what material to present, making efforts to approach uh, new guest artists. New is the early childhood programming, which they say has been selling out. Thank you, Vicki, that's two minutes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. Vicki, please feel free to complete your thought there if you would like. Yes, the early childhood programming has been selling out and they're adding a drag story time. They are committed to commissioning people of color and I spoke to um, Trizia, who leads the Theater for Change, and that in itself takes lots of risk. She's currently leading the Youth and Police Partnership, which is a 15-week workshop program where youth interact with police officers. And they've found that there are other law enforcement districts who are also interested in this program because it has proven um, to build empathy and relationships. Thank you, Vicki. I guess my recommendation after reading the application was uh, when talking about non-dominant norms, et cetera, uh, the application primarily focused on the theater for change, which absolutely focuses on non-dominant norms. But in not doing the artistic activity, I was really impressed sort of how non-dominant narratives, non-dominant strategies have, show up really across all the programs. Um, it really, it, it's clear that it's regularly considered um, and make sure it's hard when you have so many programs to show sort of all the different ways that the organization is meeting uh, that, those expectations. Um, I, I was really impressed by that. And I was glad to see that on my artistic activity visit. Panelists, are there additional questions, thoughts, comments to share? Was there um, more information about the long-term planning process as opposed to the plan itself? No, there, there was no other additional information regarding that, no. I guess I, I got a chance to speak to some of the same people Vicky got spoke to. We had touched a little bit on that as they were thinking of, and part of it, they've had a period of really extraordinary growth um, due to some of the government contracting and sort of their corporate partnership work. And basically they're understanding that there's a lot of demand. And so the long-term planning process will be understanding where they can best allocate those resources, where they need to invest in personnel. How do they leverage the resources they already have? And just that's physical, that's human. Um, and really understand sort of what it means to serve the county as a whole, including people who can get to Bethesda and people who can't get to the, the, the theater downtown. Uh, and really thinking regionally, sort of where are the opportunities and how they can be addressed.
Thank you, panelists. That's four minutes. Thank you. Laura, as a staff discipline expert, do you have any additional information to share? Um, just a few extra things to add here. Uh, thank you so much, panelists. Um, I, I found this to be um, a very, very clear written application, and um, it was great to then add in uh, your experiences as well um, as part of this. Um, I did just want to pull out a few things um, that uh, Imagination Stage adopted a new strategic plan in 2021, which is leading them through the next three years. Um, and that plan has an emphasis on social justice and community partnerships. Um, as I think it was David who mentioned the theater for change work, that's really evolved and grown into a full department in the past few years. Um, and overall, there's just extensive programming throughout the organization, which I think both of our panelists spoke to. Um, I, I found that there was a really strong sense of collaboration and community involvement in decision making um, that was uh, explored throughout the application, um, especially the idea of using uh, seemingly non arts related partners like the Department of Health and Human Services in the creative process. Um, I thought that that was a, a really unique quality um, and there seems to be a really strong commitment to evaluation and feedback. Um, couple of other things, uh, strengthening diversity on staff has been a, a real priority um, that they, they talked about in the application as they build back from um, pandemic layoffs. Um, and the demographics of the organization very closely um, relate to that of the community. And there seems to be a strong awareness of this um, and thinking about all senses of diversity, not just racial diversity. Um, so I, I think that that is also an important, important thing. Um, clear commitment to the regular consideration of non-dominant norms and david i think you spoke to this in your experience at the theater itself um, i can imagine that might be challenging especially in youth programming so so this is really heartening to read about and to hear about today from our panelists thanks so much thank you based on the information gathered from the discussion please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in smart simple in alignment with the rubric when finished click complete We'll take three minutes to do so now. And the average final score is 99%. Next. Please open application from Interact Story Theater Education Association. Application ID 2024-17728. The average initial score is 94%. 
The panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, Amanda, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. On a Friday morning, I went to Cecil County to attend my first elementary school assembly in years. Interact Story Theater's touring production of their original show, The Hero of Everything, at Rising Sun Elementary School's Cafe Gymatorium. Prior to the performance, the three-person cast mingled with the students and got ideas for interactive portions. They directly addressed the audience beforehand to introduce themselves as actors before nimbly playing multiple parts. In the play, Captain Everything learns that even heroes and sidekicks need to respectfully collaborate with their peers to overcome challenges. The cast handled action sequences and quick costume and set changes, utilizing a well-designed, tech-savvy, and transportable set. Interactive moments with the kids were sprinkled throughout, as well as silliness, zaniness, and heartfelt moments, all supporting social-emotional learning. On the chart in the application, this show was closely aligned with the third entry, an original play touring in school communities. The play fulfilled their mission, which is a, quote, meaningful, accessible, and interactive theater experience. The kids in attendance as young as pre-K were enthusiastic and about and appreciative of the show coming to their school and very invested in the plot. They seem to relate well with the superheroes and sidekicks, plus their problems and solutions. I sat directly behind special needs students who were also engaged and participated in the interactive elements in ways that worked for them. The play sparked conversations among students and their teachers and successfully brought high quality theater to these children who would otherwise not have access to a theater facility at their school. The performance was directly in line with their mission and vision that, quote, arts are for everyone and everyone learns through the arts. The location spoke directly to their statewide geographic area of service as it was about three miles from the Pennsylvania border, far from their home base in Montgomery County. The actors were noticeably racially diverse with two people of color in the three person cast. Overall, the entire experience directly supported their application, especially their mission and vision. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, Amanda will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Okay. Interact provided clarifying information on how the goals and benchmarks provided in the application relate to their formal strategic planning set for FY24. They will review the whole of FY23 to conduct research, survey, and data collect on how the pandemic changed the way they produce theater. Additionally, they will have their fiscal operations reviewed by an independent auditor for recommendations in anticipation of the formal strategic planning in FY24 and hope to have a long-term strategic plan set for FY25 through FY29 and said the goals can change as they go. The application did offer specific board demographics, citing that 75% were non-Hispanic, white, slash Caucasian, and 25% were Hispanic, slash Latinx. But the application also listed the board as 12.5% multiracial. It wasn't until after our conversation ended that I noticed that these three numbers total to 112.5%. The application also says that their survey that those surveyed reflect quote a wide diversity of gender orientation and disability status, and they spoke uh, to how the staff, artists, and board do have a wide array of disabilities and a lot of LGBTQ plus representation. At the time of the in-depth conversation on March seventh, they said that they had just started working with a consultant on board um, on related to board recruitment. They were doing a lot of research and training on how to handle board recruitment with intentionality. They've been working on board matrices to review attributes, skills, and abilities of current board members and find where they have needs and training on how to reach out comfortably to potential new board members. They're hoping to recruit and onboard two new board members by the end of this fiscal year ending in June and then at least three new members next fiscal year. In regards to the question about plays based on folk tales or legends, all of their plays have been original with the exceptional of only two adaptations in over 10 years. In both of those instances, they were both non-Western stories. One folk tale was Latin American and one was Japanese. In short, if they use folk tales or legends, they definitely consider non-Western stories. Thank you. Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. Anybody, anybody? I will just add that you've never quite lived until you've returned as an adult to a school assembly.
Yes, in your conversation, did you talk about sort of how they proactively identify problems in the course of their operations? I know that they work really um, in depth with social emotional learning and they have uh, certain resources that they were pointing to in their application that they um, use. There was also a study guide um, that I didn't mention in the um, uh, in, in my report, um, but they the study guide also is rather in depth and it's I guess it's not a study guide, but it's more like a companion piece for uh, parents and teachers and caregivers and things like that, um, which also speaks to social emotional learning. So I'm assuming that they use um, things that are related to that in terms of how to go about creating these different works. Um, I didn't specifically ask them how they went about that, though. Thank you. Um, just to add, though, that they did say that they have one new show each um, year, essentially, and that there's a full repertory sort of that they can pull from. And uh, so that if they were to return to, say, the same school for five or six consecutive years, that no student would see the same production. Um, so they have a full lineup of different things. So if you saw something as a kindergartner, you wouldn't see it again as a fourth or fifth grader. Panelists, any additional questions, thoughts, recommendations? If not, Laura, as a staff discipline expert, do you have any additional information to share? Um, Amanda, you really hit on pretty much every one of my notes or answered every one of my questions. So um, I will be very brief here. Um, I, I just thought uh, just to pull out there, they have uh, very clear organizational goals related to equity across the organization. Um, a, a very collaborative process in their play development. Um, as, as Amanda shared, there is a formal strategic plan uh, set there in the works, and then that, that will be set for FY25 to FY29. Um, and I think just, just as Amanda was, um, you know, discussing the details, I think that's a great opportunity to really welcome in the thoughts and the feedback from the community at large. Um, so would encourage them to really incorporate those opportunities for feedback on their work and their programming through the upcoming strategic planning process. Um, and they also have plans to increase staffing in the coming years, which I, I would imagine um, those plans will be incorporated into the upcoming strategic plan. And if not, then I would encourage them to consider how that works into the plan. Um, and I actually had the question about um, about how non-Western, um, you know, folk tales and legends and things like that show up in their storytelling. So I'm really glad to hear about, you know, the when they do use that kind of source material, it's coming from a multicultural uh, perspective. So thanks so much for all of that, Amanda. Sure. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now.
and the average final score is 95%. All right, panelists, we're going to be starting here. And it's great. We can all be at 206 at 26. We'll be back in a minute. Catherine, you're, you broke up when I, I, I missed all of what was just said. Could you repeat oh, that, please? I'm so sorry. I'm just saying that we're going to take a 10-minute break right now. Um, so we're, we'll return here. Let's make it 10.07. Uh, all right, see so you back here at 10.07. Thank you.
All right, panelists, it is now 10.07. If you can make your way back. And as you return, if you wouldn't mind turning your video on so I can see that you are back or uh, give me a verbal hello. All right, David, Pam, Amanda, and Vicki, welcome back. All right. All right, we will proceed with reviews. Next, please open application from Iron Crow Theater Company. Application ID 2024-18399. The average initial score is 85%. The panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, Amanda, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. I met with the artistic director and managing director to review a variety of media as the artistic activity. We discussed the 2022-2023 season of Defiance as a whole with each show relating to this theme. For example, their first play, Mankind, featured a world where, quote, women are extinct, everyone's gay, abortion is illegal. And it was moved up from a later slot after Roe v. Wade was overturned. I'll focus the rest of my artistic activity on their musical production, Head Over Heels. Photos and video footage showed a more mature version than the show, uh, than the original sort of candy-coated Broadway version. It featured elevated design elements with an edgy rock concert vibe as shown in their lighting and the set made of scaffolding and road trunks. Baltimorean James Magruder, who adapted the Broadway script, joined the production team and rewrote some text for this production, which provided updates and removed ableist language. The original Go-Go's drummer also came and participated in a talkback and book signing. Head Over Heels, the December main stage production, is in accordance with the activities chart. It supports their mission to produce queer theater for a queer city as it is written by features characters that are, explores thematic elements that are, and has actors that identify as queer. I saw sophisticated unified marketing with elegant artwork and top-notch visual brand standards, um, all which were mentioned in the chart. Iron Crow's vibrant professional production definitely works towards their vision of becoming Baltimore's first mid-size equity house. The meeting and media I experienced for the artistic activity supported their application overall. Iron Crow's vision says that it is a creative environment founded on professionalism that is both safe and inclusive to all. Their production team and cast are listed with pronouns. They use an intimacy and fight director and do anti-harassment training for each production, and they are trauma aware to support the queer and ally artists. Their productions, unified by a season-long theme, are timely and, quote, support, elevate, and celebrate the queer community. Thank you. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, Vicki, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. I had an engaging and informative conversation with artistic director Sean Elias and managing director, director April Forer. Sean's observation is that in the mid-Atlantic region, there exists a three-tier theater system, community theater, no pay, middle theater, may or may not be equity, offers wages, and okay, sometimes compensation, um, the example being the now closed single carrot and then the major houses center stage in every man. He believes that young talent in the region does not come to Baltimore because they can't afford to because of their lack of the middle tier. So his goal is to establish Iron Crow as Baltimore's middle tier house. They currently offer higher stipends, bring in equity artists, um, playwrights and techs when, whenever possible so that actors and crew have the opportunity to work and learn with professionals. They are resident artists or actors, designers, tech, who are committed to working and learning. Uh, management is in constant communication with equity regarding next steps. For instance, they know more funding is required to progress to different tier contracts, and this informs their fundraising and interaction with donors. They're working towards the small professional theater agreement for actors and stage management. Uh, Long-term planning is focused on strengthening and promoting the organization by partnering with other community organizations. Um, uh, they want to extend the runs of shows to four weeks so community as well as media has time to come and see what they're doing. Um, they say that press coverage has increased. They want to eventually find their own space. They currently rent at Theater Project. However, that's not an immediate priority. Um, as Ma Amanda said, Sean says the goal is to be queer theater for a queer city. It was clear that he loves the, this theater and the city, and they're committed to attracting the best theater creatives, new and established, to work and train. 
Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. I was just so impressed with um, the way that uh, he was, uh, Sean was specifically talking about how they are trying at Iron Crow to become a new equity house in Baltimore. And so to that end, like uh, Vicki was saying, that they are working really hard to work within the bounds of equity and um, they are in constant communication with them and that they are upholding themselves to that sort of standard um, with this aspiration going forward. I have to say, Amanda and Vicki, it's been very helpful to hear about what, what it takes to become an equity house. That was certainly um, a, a theme in the narrative, but I was left with kind of wondering what, what their next steps were. And so it is really helpful to hear about the financing of hearing about the extended runs and such are there, you know, yeah. real priorities. And they're very committed. I mean, Sean was just so enthusiastic. It was It was one of the best conversations that I had. It was very engaging. He's very clear and focused about their steps. And he really, he really wants to get new young creatives there to work. And so he's doing whatever he can to make that happen. And that everything feeds towards this unified season um, and that the season has a theme and that all the everything funnels towards that same theme uh, so that it highlights and has uh, like better conversations for audience goers to um, relate to that theme. So in this the season of defiance and what does that mean and how can we be defiant and in what ways and, and things. And so everything works towards that, including the all the posters and the marketing and the 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 lighting even. I, I mean, it was like truly like a rock concert and very different. Um, I saw the Broadway production of Head Over Heels and to see some of the clips and things from what they did, very different, definitely their own take, very, very unique. Panelists, any additional questions, comments, recommendations? If not, Laura is a staff discipline expert. Do you have any additional information to share? Yes, thank you again, panelists. Um, I did, did want to make one note about this particular application. Um, the applicant shows that um, none of their programming in the, the chart goes beyond tuition paying constituents. But I think based on reading their activities chart and based on this conversation, I, I don't believe that that's actually the correct choice as most of their programming doesn't involve tuition. So I think that that should have actually been the 75 to 100%. So just in case that was influencing your scoring at all, just to have that understanding. Um, thanks so much for the uh, the details on the, the long term goals uh, that, that both of you spoke to. Um, I, you know, I think that they, they shared a really clear um, SWOT analysis, um, you know, and they seem to have that ultimate goal established. Um, so I would encourage them to think now about what that formalized strategic plan might look like and having those um, specific goals and benchmarks um, and strategies along the way to get to that ultimate goal of the, you know, the equity status um, for the, the theater. Um, I think that might be there at that point that that might be a helpful thing to start to think about. Um, I'd also encourage them to explore a bit further about their resident artists. Um, Vicki shared a little bit about that, um, and it is mentioned briefly in the, um, the application, um, but it, it didn't uh, actually pop up in, in the application until about halfway through. So I, I'd love to just know a bit more about that structure, how they're playing a part in the decision-making process and the long-term planning. Um, how does one become a resident artist and, and what is 
the value of that structure to the overall mission of the programming. I think just having that information would be helpful to know. Um, I would also recommend that based on the financials submitted, the organi organization um, might utilize its long-term um, strategic planning efforts to establish some strategies to further diversify their income streams to ensure, ensure um, future financial stability. Um, and finally, just, just to note, by nature of their mission and their programming, they are regularly considering non-dominant norms in, in American theater. Thanks so much. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now. And the average final score is 88%. Next, please open application from Lumina Studio Theater Company. Application ID 2024-17567. The average initial score is 93%. The panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, Pam, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Lumina Studio Theater is a company based in Silver Spring in Montgomery County. The organization is committed to provide opportunities for young actors of any level of experience who seek to perform Shakespeare or other plays of the classical repertory, and also modern plays that focus on the beauty of language. My artistic evaluation was in a, it was a rehearsal room conversation with co-executive artistic directors Meg LeBeau and Sophie Cameron, who prepared a selection of videos and still photos that showed the older and younger companies on stage and outdoor productions camp, um, supplemental education and team building activities. And they had offered to allow me to sit in on rehearsals, but they're usually closed and the company's non-professional youth actors, so I didn't want to distract. Um, but this way I was able to follow up in real time um, with the leadership and ask questions about the artistic process and clarify the work. I found the artistic activities were of high quality in all areas, the excellence in acting, in the quality of the script, high caliber production elements, um, there lots of professional support for the text and contextual work of the classics. 
my experience corresponded with what I found in the application. I think Lumina, it shows that it produces plays of professional quality and holds every young actor to a high standard of performance. Um, their Shakespeare-based acting techniques are employed effectively. Uh, they bring together young people of different ages to create a shared experience of artistic fulfillment and foster uh, youth leadership opportunities through the arts. They've created a supportive community of collaborators dedicated to producing quality theater with the youth. And they've also created a community engagement program that draws in new audience members. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, Pam, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Lumina Studio Theater is a 28-year-old company dedicated to um, opportunities for young actors at any level. And the organization is led by two co-executive directors who were hired in 2021. They shaped their positions to share the duties that were previously held by a managing director and a different artistic ex executive director. The organization has a seven member board that oversees the organization's fundraising, financials, parent engagement, outreach, and inclusion. Currently, the board is made up of alumni and parents and Lumina recognizes they must grow beyond that pool because it has built-in limitations in their diversity and in their program evolution. The organization is seeking to diversify to better reflect the geographic service area. Lumina is um, more racially diverse in their younger aged participants and they seek to ensure that that diversity continues as participants age. The theater has established best practices to increase diversity and the presence, their presence within the extraordinarily diverse Kent Mill Elementary is a key to this initiative. The partnership, which started in the fall, allows Lumina to conduct after school drama programs through MCPS's linkages to learnings programs so students could participate at no cost. Lumina is also engaging in more community partnerships, such as work with Ivan Theatrics, a local company that performs in English, Bengali, and Hindi. During Ivan Theatrics Diverse ET Festival in March, Lumina is presenting a scene from Love's Labor's Lassoed. Lumina has been increasing the diversity of adult guest uh, artists and their artistic team. Another community connection began in 2021 when the company could only perform outdoors. They sparked great community interest as people who were previously unfamiliar with the organization stopped and viewed the performances. Lumina discovered a great outreach program. They're now committed to performing folk tales geared for young audiences outdoors in the park every year. All outdoor performances are pay what you can. Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. Thank you, Pam. I had a question just about, could you speak any more to sort of how the mission, vision, goals, values evolved over the last two years? Did that come up in your conversation any further? Um, I think it evolved over the last two years because there's a change in, in leadership, but it's been a constant, um, uh, a constant discussion. I think in expanding the board and expanding um, opportunities to diversify, it is, it is, um, changing the, the kind of long range visioning and, and, and capturing that. And so it, I would say it's a work in progress. Certainly. So I guess my recommendation then would be to be able to articulate so for the organization to articulate. So if there are changes to how the mission or the vision is what those look like and what sort of how the values evolve, it's been clearly a, a two years of experimentation, some changes to operations. How does that then uh, affect the organization's uh, mission, vision, goals, values going forward? And was there more information um, from them about how they reach out to uh, yet to be known constituents for main stage ensemble and summer stock programs aside from the uh, way that they reached out to folks in the park? Well, it happened upon gaining footing in the park. Um, one would be through um, partnerships in elementary schools that linkages to learnings is an MCPS program. Um, they felt really strong about the Kemp Mill um, relationship, but it's new. Um, but they, I think, see that it's a, a, a 
excellent growth area and it really diversified. It's very different from the um, traditional uh, population that they had served. Um, and also doing more community engagement programs through um, um, partnerships with other community organizations, whether they are artistic based or, um, or uh, otherwise. They, um, for example, through doing Oliver, um, uh looked to working in um a, a food pantry um just um uh, so so again looking to to link their um thematics um and, and the community in linking in i would recommend that perhaps they uh, find ways to change the answer that they have in the chart so that it isn't the same answer for each one of the responses that appear in the chart then mm -hmm. Oh, well, thank you, Pam. I really appreciate what you brought because that really helped give me a lot more context to sort of what that means for them and sort of all the ways that they are thinking broadly about bringing in community members. Thank you very much. Panelists, any additional thoughts, comments, recommendations? If not, Laura is a staff discipline expert. Do you have any additional information to share? Um, I do. Um, just to um, to kind of uh, elaborate a little bit further um, on David's question about um, the vision, mission, goals, values section, um, just to point to their response in A2, um, that the staff and the board added core values to the mission statement in 2021. So I'm assuming the staff and the board had some kind of collaborative process to develop that. Um, and there's a little bit more information just within that response. So just to point to that, if that's helpful at all. Um, and then just to note that uh, I think through Pam's report there, we can see that there, there's a lot of clear reflection happening with this organization and a lot of growth happening as well. Um, much of the programming is tuition based, um, but I think we learned a lot from, um, from Pam today about some of those free experiences and community partnerships that are happening. So um, I would encourage the organization to further consider how they are reaching beyond those who are paying for, uh, for experiences, but it seems like things are in the works and happening there. Um, there is a management plan that was implemented to bring the organization through FY25. So that seems to be their uh, long-term planning at the moment. Um, and the co-leadership model that has um, taken shape over the past couple of years, um, sharing joint responsibilities, um, appears to be really successful for the organization. Um, there seems to be a really clear commitment to identifying and addressing challenges with the board. Um, there seems to be a clear awareness to the fact that the organization doesn't quite match the demographics of the area yet. Um, but I wanted to pull out um, an effort that that was really successful for them. Um, they had an open community dialogue in winter 2022, where they learned that transportation was a major obstacle. Um, and because of this, they implemented a whole new strategy of developing a carpool network. So I thought that was just a really great example of, you know, receiving that feedback and then implementing something. Um, Addressing race and gender uh, comes through in play selection and interpretations of classic text. I would encourage them to consider how non-Western canon is being explored on their stage and also thinking about um, acting techniques. They mention a lot of um, uh, primarily rooted in Western thought and practice um, acting techniques like Stella Adler. So just thinking about how they can incorporate other, other thoughts and other practices as well. Thanks so much. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now.
and the average final score is 94%. Next, please open application from Maryland Ensemble Theater, application ID 2024-17653. The average initial score is 88%. The panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, Amanda, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. On a Saturday morning, on what happened to be one of the only days that it snowed this season, I attended Maryland Ensemble Theater's fun company production, The Snowy Day and Other Stories by Ezra Jack Keats in Frederick. It, I was an atypical audience goer as a childless adult, as this production was meant for children and their families to enjoy together by bringing beloved stories from the Caldecott winning author to life. The Snowy Day, plus Whistle for Willie, Goggles, and A Letter for Amy. With diverse casting and simple props and costumes like Peter's classic red hat and coat, the small ensemble chronicled childhood adventures of the young protagonist. They use short songs with a range of musical genres, including doo-wop, jazz, and funk, a plethora of beautiful silhouette puppetry, a delightful dog puppet, fantasy sequences, and interactive moments with the kids. This production was part of the MET Fun Company Family Theater and aligned with the chart in the application. It was beautifully adapted uh, it beautifully adapted children's literature into an engaging, high-quality theatrical production, was enjoyable for the whole family, and likely created lasting memories through the laughter and heartfelt stories, and even the post-show photo opportunities with the cast. They had kid-friendly seating on colorful, squishy mats on the same level as the stage, allowing wiggly kids to sit comfortably and close to the action. This show was true to the mission of enabling people, even very tiny people, Quote, to feel more, think deeper, and laugh longer. The selection of this show, which focuses on people of color and the very racially diverse attendees, speaks to their diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts as well. Thank you. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, Pam, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Pam, if you're speaking, we're unable to hear you. Thanks. Sorry, I was saying my... Um, I had to organize my paper. Uh, Maryland Ensemble Theater is a 25-year-old company based in downtown Frederick. MET presents a robust season of main stage productions, fun company family productions, comedy nights, after-school programs, camps, theater workshops, including some workshops designed specifically for seniors. MET has a strong history of new and devised work, more than 60 to date, including an upcoming main stage premiere, South and Saints, exploring the history and stories of Frederick's Black community. MET maintains an ensemble of 40 actors, technicians, writers, administrators, and others who have a strong and how have strong and historic ties to the company and or take, undertake programming and advise the organization's direction. As part of the organization's strategic planning, it advanced DEI efforts working with Dr. Denise Rollins through meetings and retreats in the pandemic. They shaped vision and values and identified specific items to accomplish moving forward to be more representative of the community, beginning with a more diverse representation of the production choices and artists on its stage. The company also undertook an organizational climate assessment as it transitioned back to in-person interactions. This is the company's first season after capital renovations that provide more artistic flexibility and more services for patrons with disabilities. MET is combining with the Weinberg Theater and New Spire to form a theater row in Frederick, and this should draw more arts atten attendance to Frederick. MET is proud of its deep connections to its community and its work to instill a love for the art form. Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. You addressed this a little bit, Pam, but do you have any other context that you wanted to share about? So are there additional strategies to reach yet to be known constituents? They were very mindful about working first with um, the stories on their stage and the um, uh, and the actors on their stage, and then building out that that would then expand audiences. But they wanted to focus mindfully first on um, uh, on the artistic product. Uh, Pam, I have a question. Uh, do you have information on how the staffing might further reflect the population in the geographic area of service? Um, by chance, any further information on that? I don't have it in the notes in front of me. Um, I'll, I'll continue to look as we talk and see if there's anything there. But. 
I think that leads to two recommendations, one of which is to be thinking proactively about how you bring in new audience members. This is a really exciting moment, especially the development of that theater row, and to expose people to the arts that aren't already familiar with the organization. And to be thinking the work on the stage is crucially important, and the community as well, how they are part of it uh, and active parts of it. And I also would recommend uh, using data to formally track and formally think about sort of the diversity of the uh, personnel and how that reflects the constituency of the geographic area of service. Pam, did they have more information on specifically how con constituents um, are involved uh, with the organization input directly? Uh, I have my... Um, Constituents are involved, but I would say that uh, having um, having a pipeline of of um, of participation that feeds to being part of the ensemble because the ensemble is really broadly defined. Um, so uh, constituents can start as as audience members, get more involved, and then and then feed through a pipeline of just more and more um, um, ties to the ties to the organization. But not specifically more with like decision-making processes or show selection or things of that nature? Um, correct, it would be more of, of that broad ensemble. Um, uh, Participatory, mm -hmm. okay. It's, and they, they're, they're very committed to being connected to the community and of the community. Um, uh that you couldn't kind of plunk them into you know any other any other city um from the artwork that they that they devise um you know just a very thoughtful reflection of of of, of frederick and history and the people who form it Thank you, panelists. That's four minutes. Thank you. Laura, as a staff discipline expert, do you have any additional information to share? Um, just a few things. Amanda and Pam actually hit on most of my notes. So just to, uh, to briefly add um, that the uh, organization updated their mission and vision as part of the 2019 strategic plan, and that strategic plan is bringing them through 2024. Um, they also added an equity statement uh, with the use of a task force um, somewhat recently as well. Um, I noted that it seems that they have a really open and collaborative creative process, um, which which Pam alluded to as well, um, that relies heavily on the ensemble. So I'm glad to know a little bit more about the ensemble from you, Pam, because that, that was most of my question marks was around the role of the ensemble. So I would recommend that they consider um, expanding a bit on that definition of, you know, who is a part of that ensemble? How does one become a part of the ensemble? Um, what is their role within the decision making process and how is the ensemble reflective of the community as, whole, as a whole? I think that that information would be helpful to know just within the context of the application. Um, so I would recommend elaborating a bit further there. Um, to Amanda's question about community involvement, I did make a note that there is a strong commitment to um, working with local vendors and local partnerships. Um, so perhaps also, you know, uh, digging a bit more into that um, would also be helpful to know. Um, there is a description of a really effective feedback loop that they're using um, and clear budgeting plans. Um, there is currently a focus on um, accessibility plans and adding more uh, ADA options and offerings. Um, so um, that that is a um, exciting thing to hear about. Um, I think I think it was David. Just a, a plus one to it would be really helpful to know more about the demographics. So I would recommend that they dig into um, more of that. 
um, just so that we're understanding how the demographics of the board and staff and the ensemble too, um, how they reflect the community. Um, and just to wrap up their repertoire, um, especially the original works are, are working to lift non-dominant um, and often unheard voices in the theater. And um, the example that Pam spoke about, the upcoming South and Saints, I believe is what it's called, um, is really considering uh, that creative risks through some non-dominant norms. Thanks so much. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now. and the average final score is 90%. Next, please open application from Mil Milburn Stone Theater at Cecil College. Application ID 2024-17573. The average initial score is 82%. The panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, David, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Thank you, Kathy. With over 350 seats and a large stage, Milburn Stone Theater, or MST, is located on the campus of Cecil College in Northeast Maryland, not far from the Delaware State Line. I attended Murder on the Nile, a Milburn Stone Theater production of Agatha Christie's play adapted from her no novel, Death on the Nile, an infrequently staged adaptation of a classic mystery full of surprising twists. Patrons were able to see a variety of eccentric characters with complex and at times conflicting motivations. Several of the characters meet a tragic end, and the culprit is discovered through prudent observations by members of the assembled group. There were moments of audible gasps as characters and audience members alike reacted to the events unfolding. The surprising ending requires audiences to pay close attention to various key moments, question the preconceptions they may have had, and consider how the events prior to and throughout the play led the characters to make their choices. 
MST is committed to programming a balance of familiar titles with less familiar titles. As a part of MST's season of theatrical productions, this show clearly appealed to both existing patrons with a fondness for well-known stories, as well as audiences new to Christie's work who may have only heard the title before. Mystery plays provide thrills and intellectual stimulation, and MST values providing different types of shows throughout the year to serve and ideally broaden their constituents' artistic constituents' artistic interests. MST provides the audience with the opportunity to experience fully realized plays produced by and featuring their community members in a large, comfortable, and accessible setting. In presenting Murder on the Nile, Milburn Stone Theater fulfilled its mission of providing entertainment, provoking thought, eliciting emotion, and fostering the community's appreciation for the arts. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, Amanda, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. The 14 to 20 person season selection advisory committee is anchored by staff as both the director and artistic director are on it. Others include regular patrons, season ticket holders, and representatives of local businesses that advertise with them. They look for folks who are diverse ethnic ethnically and geographically covering Maryland counties plus parts of Pennsylvania, Delaware, and or New Jersey. The creative process follows a timeline and has public involvement. The aforementioned season selection committee with public input meets monthly November to January or February. In April, they announced the season running from August to June and put out applications for production staff. Any director can submit a pitch for a show, so this is another way the public is involved. From April to August, they hire about 50% of the production staff. Shows have auditions, paid production positions, and volunteer opportunities all open to the public. For the staffing chart, cast, contract, cast contracted positions and volunteers all fall under both the director and artistic director. By working in tandem, they are able to address needs in working partnership. Since the theater is part of the community college, the college trustees are technically at the top of the staffing chart, but they use the season selection committee as a sounding board. They cited several goals and uh, values. They wanted to help others and pro provide a learning space, especially those who want to get into theater work. They want the community to be involved and aspire to serve as outreach for the college and art as a whole in Cecil County. In regards to patrons, they plan to offer shows that they have a connection to already, as well as new material. For the actors, they want to help them fill out their portfolio, give them exposure, and provide a chance to act on stage. Financially, their goal is to be solvent. In terms of staff input, they hold bi-weekly staff meetings and conversations happen all the time. Staff frequently suggest ideas, including shows for selection and provide constructive feedback via the two positives and a negative method. The staff works together so that everyone is on board as a team. Thank you. Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. Amanda, my question was, uh, in your conversation, did you address sort of, uh, they, in, in the application they discussed at, the, at times when they consider non-dominant norms, et cetera. Are there, is there a commitment to regularly uh, considering non-dominant norms and values uh, throughout their programming process? Sure. Uh, so they uh, seem as though that they are really committed to uh, doing that sort of thing uh, with non-dominant norms uh, and balancing it with um, their patron uh, expectations. Um, so they have what they call uh, tent pole shows, which are the ones that they know are the big crowd pleasing shows that they know will do very well. Um, they're often family favorite type shows, um, things like Sound of Music, for example, or something like that. And then they have ones that push the envelope quite a bit for the, the area, Cecil County, and um, just for the patrons that they have in general. Uh, so they might be newer or edgier or shows that might push the um, non-dominant norms, things like Fun Home. Uh, so those that address um, certain uh, folks who are less, you know, more marginalized or certain groups that are, um, you know, more racially diverse or specific stories that speak to uh, certain populations. Thank you. And they, they really did try to, um, they have nine shows, I think, in their season, which is exceptional. And they do work really hard at trying to make a an incredibly good balance of different varieties of shows um, throughout the whole season, um, which I thought was, um, it was a really great conversation with them. And um, anybody else? <laughs> Was there any discussion of the long term planning and committing um, ideas and strategies to paper? 
Give me just a second. Um, I know that they, as part of the college, I know one of the things that they they did mention was that they have the um, good fortune or sort of luxury of having the college to fall back on in terms of you know financial safety nets and things like that. Uh, so I do believe that they are working really hard at trying to continue to push the envelope at certain shows that are you know more uh, progressive for the area, uh, especially and that they're working on better advertisements. They did relay a story about how they had giant swaths of windows in their um, in their office space that weren't really being used for anything. And it was like, they felt like they were in a fishbowl and being stared at. And so as part of a way to not just like put up blinds and seal everybody off, they actually installed these window clings. And so it's trying to let people know that who visit the college because they are on a college campus that there are shows there and that they are there. So they're working on trying to reach out to the community more and build um, sort of a better understanding for the folks in the community that they're there and their shows there and art is there and that they should come and visit it. And people will know that uh, that more about the the theater company there. Um, but in terms of specific long-term planning, I don't think I have any very specific notes on that. Mm -hmm. I guess then I would just um, voice a recommendation to the theater to um, to indicate if they do have a scheduled commitment to undertake long-term strategy, and if they don't, um, to consider um, moving some of the ideas that they seem to talk about onto to paper with actionable steps. I think it's well observed, Pam, but I also think that in how they describe their long-term planning process, I really appreciate it. It, it was not overly complex, but it had some really specific stakeholders and key ideas of what they want to be moving towards for mm -hmm. them. And so even without a codified, like written down strategic plan, I think their commitment to long-term planning is unquestionable. Thank you, panelists. That's four minutes. Thank you. Laura, as a staff discipline expert, do you have any additional information to share? Um, just a few additional notes. Thank you so much, panelists. Um, I did just want to um, lift up that Milburn Stone is um, serving a community in Cecil County that doesn't have a lot of access to a lot of other um, arts organizations, particularly theaters. So, so the organization is really serving an identified need and a gap in the community. And I think as, as Amanda was saying, they, they or maybe it was David, I can't remember, they have an incredible amount of programming. So they are doing, they are serving that community um, August through June, a lot of activities, um, including not only the theatrical works, but also special events like comedy nights and film festivals and such. So there's, there's a lot happening with the organization. Um, I, I too had noted um, that there, appears to be a real awareness for the the need for a formal strategic plan for the organization and and there were as david mentioned some some very specific um, ideas and stakeholders that are mentioned um, in the application so I, I might encourage the organization to think about you know is it time to put that long-term plan um, of some sort into you know into writing and and thinking about that for for the future um, I did want to note that there is a heavy reliance on earned income, so I would recommend uh, working towards a strategy which might come as part of that long term planning to become less reliant on earned income sources. Um, and Amanda, thank you so much for sharing the details um, about the consideration of non dominant norms. Um, from the uh, organization when it comes to their season planning. Um, I had some, some recommendations around that, but I'm, I'm really glad to hear that that is a regular consideration that's happening. And I would encourage them to just keep digging into that, um, you know, and thinking about how that can show up on the Milburn stage. Thanks so much. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now.
and the average final score is 87%. Next, please open application from only theater, application ID 2024-17614. The average, average initial score is 98%. The panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, Pam, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. My artistic evaluation of Olney Theater Center was based on attending a performance of Kinky Boots, a large-scale Broadway-style Tony and Grammy Award-winning musical by Cindy Lauper and Harvey Firestein. Kinky Boots is the story of a troubled shoe factory that forms a partnership with the drag queen to design and manufacture a line of high-heeled boots for drag performers and others and save the business. Themes of acceptance, insider versus outsider, finding commonality, the risks of being outside the dominant norm run through the script. Olney's production was of the highest quality with a strong local cast, many of whom are Actors' Equity members, a multi-level flexible set, live musicians, and extraordinary costumes and wigs. The house was full, diverse, enthusiastic. Many of the performances have been sold out. Community engagement activities related to the production seek to expand Olney's reach to provide opportunities to attract and serve new audiences and provide ways to elevate and celebrate drag culture. These are an extension of the theater's community engagement committee's work and a commitment to make the theater a more welcoming space overall. This focus also includes improvements to Olney's Outdoor Root Family Theater and other facility improvements that are underway as part of an ongoing capital campaign. My experience supported Olney's responses in the, the State Arts Council application about their mission, their creative process, the sensory experience, and their community engagement. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, David, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Thank you, Kathy. For my in-depth conversation with Olney Theater Center, I met with Michael Mercier, Deputy Director of Advancement Institutional Giving, Dina Goldman, Director of Advancement, Debbie Ellinghouse, Managing Director, and Jason Loweth, Artistic Director. Since returning to in-person performances, Olney has been focused on expanding their offerings and capacity. This has included the musical theater productions for which they're best known, as well as new works, curated programs, and outdoor performances. This variety of programming has enabled them to better seek out and engage audiences not formerly aware of Olney, understanding their cultural interests and traditions, engaging community members to make introductions, holding listening sessions and special events, and regularly convening a diverse community engagement committee. Insight from new community members has had a substantial impact on season planning and the choices the artistic team has made. The expansion of remote work and participation has enabled the artistic team to meet more local actors, and these conversations led to improved work conditions at the theater. In addition to advocates in the rehearsal room, like the director and production team members, artists can and do regularly share their thoughts with leadership team members, the board ombudsperson, the BIPOC artist advocate, and a psychotherapist on retainer. Engaging the board has been another key priority. Understanding the different ways that community volunteers can contribute to the organization, they have waived the minimum contribution when necessary to ensure the board is racially, professionally, and culturally diverse. Their investments as part of the Staging and Future campaign will increase their performance spaces, update technology and equipment, as well as provide the first dedicated space for education programs. In doing so, only demonstrates their deep understanding that theater in all its form has a lasting, monumental impact on those who experience it, with the unique ability to transcend the vibes and improve the quality of life for all members of their community. Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. And to Justice and my comments, but I just wanted to applaud their efforts to better reflect the constituency of the geographic area of service with their personnel. Uh, my recommendation is that they continue to, to uh, undertake the efforts that are underway to clearly reflect the constituency in the future. I was curious if they had indicated at all about where they do have volunteers and where they do fall on the chart, on the staffing chart, or under whom. 
specifically. Absolutely. And so uh, some of the volunteers are their ushers, the people who are there to assist people who are attending performances. They are primarily managed by a house manager in the moment, as well as they're the dedicated staff person who oversees volunteers and course of the regular operation. Board members also serve as volunteers and they're primar primarily managed by managing director's office with I believe it's the gen uh, general manager who also provides some support to the board as well as the development team in certain ways. Um, other volunteers who show up are people who are those who are making those connections who are hosting either events or dinners or listening sessions to be able to uh, really introduce only to new different people. That has come in a couple different places. Some of that has been with the community engagement team, some of that's been with the development team, some of that I believe also in the managing director's office, some of that was with the artistic team and understanding sort of people who are excited to provide feedback and provide thoughts on how only can expand. Volunteers are really incorporated across a lot of different places in the organization and it really would depend on which uh, kind of volunteer and which uh, what their service is. Um, I would perhaps recommend that they include them on the staffing chart in the various places where they might fall and um, also include a color coding uh, key because I see that it is multicolored, but I have no idea what the yellow, green or blue represents. Panelists, any other thoughts, recommendations, questions? If not, Laura, as a staff discipline expert, do you have any additional information to share? Um, just a few additional notes to share. Thank you so much, panelists, for your great reports there. Um, I, I found this overall to be a very clear application with lots of details and panelists. You added even more to that. So thank you so much for uh, for your additions. Um, just wanted to, to raise up that they have a new and revised mission and values as of 2020. Um, and that new mission really takes the organization from a traditional regional theater to a new and different model. Um, there's a, a description of, of only being a cultural hub, investing in curated presentations that uplift independent artists and other art forms. Um, just wanted to highlight that they have some um, new initiatives such as the, the new all access subscription model and the first time free ticket program um, as ways to engage new audiences uh, into, uh, into the theater. Um, really thorough creative process is described involving lots of voices and feedback. Um, I think that was a, a particularly strong uh, uh, description. Um, they had a strategic plan that brought them through 2023, but this had to be altered due to the pandemic. Um, but there is a really strong commitment to that long term and strategic planning and evaluating and shifting as needed. Um, I also thought there was a really clear commitment to transparency from leadership. Um, I really like there was one particular idea that they highlighted about um, a budget workshop that is available to staff to show how the annual budget takes shape. So I thought that was just a, a really clear demonstration of that transparency. Um, couple other things just briefly. Uh, they acknowledge that their board doesn't quite yet match the demographics of the community, but significant changes have been made in the last few years. And there are really clear and tangible HR related policies that have been put into place for staff hiring that they've seen an impact um, through that in the makeup of their staff. Um, and finally, just some really strong examples of regular consideration of non-dominant norms in their programming. Thanks so much. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now.
and the average final score is 98%. Next, please open application from Other Voices, application ID 2024-18916. The average initial score is 68%. And panelists, just to note, Other Voices is typically in the multidiscipline A group, but since they have a strong theater component, we included them in today's review. So uh, accordingly, Emily is gonna be acting as the staff discipline expert for their application. Uh, the panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, David, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Uh, thank you, Abby. I attended a performance of Misery on the main stage at Other Voices Theatre in Frederick, Maryland, adapted from the Stephen King novel that was previously adapted into the Oscar-winning film. The play almost entirely confines the action to the home of nurse Annie Wilkes, where she maniacally keeps the author of her favorite book series captive. The play reduces the cast to Annie, author Paul Sheldon, and the local sheriff, and brings an increased intimacy to a brutal psychological horror story. A small venue provides an up-close view of the story's vicious foreshadowing, twists, and violent acts. Audience members are invited to carefully observe how the two characters struggle to persuade, mislead, and attack one another. It's a play that asks audience to consider the extraordinary lengths each character will go to in order to attain their objective, at times diametrically opposed. As the artistic director mentioned in his pre-show welcome to the audience, this show is a departure in some ways from the productions for which this community theater is best known, namely large cast musicals for all ages with heartwarming messages. However, a production like Misery has adult and serious themes and psychologically complex characters and situations. This contributes to the theater's mission to provide a comprehensive and affordable theater experience through productions and performance opportunities for volunteers. Other Voices also collaborated with other local theater companies to gather the personnel and materials needed to successfully bring this show to life. In doing so, they fulfilled their promise to cultivate a community that actively both partakes in and experiences cultural offerings. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, Vicki, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. I met with Steve um, Carnes, the artistic director. He's worked with Other Voices for over five years and assumed the artistic director position last summer. Um, their grant focused on the SWOT analysis of productions rather than answering the question about the success of the staffing structure. So I asked him if he could speak to this, um, what's going on with the staff. And his response was that the staff is fluid. He said they have students, uh, students assisting. There's a lighting and sound designer on staff and a volunteer coordinator runs front of house. Um, you, you'll see on, on their application that they submitted a list of board and a pie chart for the breakdown of staff employees. Um, Steve didn't seem to have any actual knowledge of staff success or concerns. Uh, there was a question that the panel had regarding developing and approving the annual budget. And I asked about the steering committee's role regarding the budget because the grant states that the steering committee meets on a monthly basis to re review production and operating budgets. So Steve said the board, not the steering committee is the decision-making entity. He said he needed more information to be able to, to fully answer the question. And he said that he has not seen a budget. He said that he would provide a budget to me um, to forward, but he has not. Um, regarding the missing demographic information, um, he said he couldn't speak to specific demographic info regarding Frederick. He said that the board is diverse as regards gender, um, meaning that they're men and women. He says they try to select shows for diversity. Um, they now have director submissions, which in um, the past they were done by play reading committee. And I think he implied that that meant more diversity. Uh, asked about their process for obtaining feedback. And um, he said feedback is actor driven. So it relies on conversations. There are no surveys. I asked Thank about it. Two minutes. Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. Vicki, if you'd like to complete your thought, please go ahead. 
Yeah, I asked about the art the activity chart showing no show selected for July through February. And he says they hope to have a season decided by early April or sooner um, regarding the impact of long term planning meeting, whether it did or did not involve into a strategic plan. Um, action items included addressing how he says how we do classes, community involvement and on and on stage, um, how to address diversity. Um, he said they'll be working on these concerns this year. He has submitted a budget to the board. When asked about the intended sensory experience, he began to focus on the impact of ticket prices and community outreach. And I asked him to speak to audience emotion reactions. And he said he wants the, act the audience to leave with it all felt connected. Um, many of the specific, many of the, the questions that I asked him were not actually answered adequately or specifically however i felt that he responded to the best of his knowledge and ability thank you vicky i wanted to highlight one thing in there that i, I think is a really a key point that we want to recommend but i agree with your recommendation that sensory and emotional impact is a really crucial thing for an organization and that's something that's uh, thinking about what that wants to be and how to articulate that and how that guides decision making. Uh, I recommend giving that uh, further thoughts. Yeah, I'm not sure that he knew exactly what it meant. Uh, I'd also recommend that they have perhaps an outside facilitator to come in and do a retreat for them because it seems like the board and the staff is all disheveled and needs to be perhaps an outside person to come in and help them focus. I think it's interesting that you focused on on bringing having a consultant to bring them together. I, I would also add a recommendation that the narrative would benefit from information about how the board, the staff, and the volunteer can work together to make decisions, how they can inform each other about the work, and how they can create opportunities for everyone to grow. I think you're right. It does seem that things are just kind of not cohesive in, in any way. I also think this was given in the report, but I just want to articulate that um, though the narrative asserts that um, that there's diversity, um, I would recommend that they give specific information about race, racism, and, and to relate it to the um, staff. The, participants just so we can have a better idea of how they're uh, seeking to, to, to reflect the community. Hi, Pam. Just wanted to let you know that um, it seems like uh, your audio is kind of cutting in and out. We're getting some pieces of it, uh, so there might be a connectivity issue there. Um, I would recommend probably trying to turn your video off to see if that might help with getting the audio through. Uh, but if you wouldn't mind uh, just recapping your last thought there. Sure. I just wanted to put on, uh, to, to articulate that um, the narrative states, um, uh, asserts um, uh, and that the proposal would benefit from specific information about race, ethnicity, gender, age, economic status, and how 
the organization reflects the general population. Um, rather than just everything. That was four minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. As a staff discipline expert, do you have any additional information to share? Just a few points. And panelists, um, thank you so much. I think um, I'm in agreement with um, what's been said and had some of the same um, recommendations and uh, and feedback and questions overall. I think um, this organization would benefit by just overall further engaging with the, the application itself as it's meant to be um, reflective um, and to, to consider using this as a guide for uh, for their staff, board, volunteer discussion um, to really dig into all of the questions on all the sections of this application in particular. Um, I also noted a, a couple of things that were mentioned as well with the activities chart. Um, noticed there wasn't a lot of plans, which, um, which you all brought up and I would recommend further planning efforts in advance. And that could go hand in hand with the strategic planning um, efforts as well, which I would um, further recommend. I'm glad to see they had a SWOT analysis um, conducted, uh, but would further recommend um, additional strategic planning, whether that be um, uh, with a consultant, which was one of the recommendations as well. Um, also recommend digging into the constituent engagement and feedback and really considering beyond discussion, um, you know, other forms of, of ways to gather feedback and evaluate the, the programming and planning ahead. Um, also had thoughts around the uh, the staff chart that was provided. Um, it would be beneficial to see something um, in terms of how all the folks work together between the board, staff, volunteers, um, if there's any type of hierarchy or ways that they connect and who's reporting to whom, um, that would be helpful to know. Um, also wanted to reiterate, which I think Pam was um, saying um, that, uh, further recommend um, thinking about diversity among the, the staff um, and board and any strategies that they can um, work towards to further diversify and really um, have a good understanding of the demographics of the community that they're serving. Um, and finally, uh, just some further notes around um, sensory and emotional um, impact, uh, further consider the intent of those programs and how um, they'd want folks to feel when engaging with their um, programming and the non-dominant norms as well. Further consider creative risk uh, within programming um, and, and be in touch with me as your program director at the State Arts Council to, to connect further and help to answer any questions and, and um, be a resource uh, moving forward. Thanks everybody. And apologies if you had heard anything in the background there. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now.
and the average final score is 64%. Panelists, before we move on to the next application, I just wanted to note that um, we had initially planned to do uh, one more review before taking a 15-minute break. Um, however, we are running ahead of schedule. So I wanted to check in and see if we want to stick with the plan of putting in that break after doing one more review, or if you felt up for doing two more reviews and then taking a break. Could you let me know your preference? I don't mind, but I feel like that's a Pam question because she's in looking at the next thing, uh, Potomac Playmate, like after Port Tobacco, she has two things to deliver. Um, I prefer to stick as close to the, I have a phone call scheduled during what I thought was lunch, so getting as, as close to as helpful. Okay, so sticking as close to what the schedule that we had. So, um, so then in that case, we'll do uh, two applications before taking a break. Is that, is that, am I hearing that correctly? I don't mind waiting until 12 or as close to 12 because okay. I similarly was expecting lunch, lunch to be that, or like 12, what up, uh, 12, 10, 10, 12, 12, 10. 12, 10 to 12, 25. Even if that means that we burn through a bunch of them, I don't mind. Okay. Totally. All right. Um, then we'll we'll keep proceeding and we'll kind of get a feel for where we are with the timeline and aim for sticking with that time. All right. Thank you. Uh, please open application from Port Tobacco Players, application ID 2024-18642. The average initial score is 86%. The panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, Amanda, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. I had never been to Southern Maryland and was excited to travel to somewhere new in the state. I headed down to La Plata, about 15 miles from Virginia near the Potomac River, to visit the Port Tobacco Players, a community theater in a quaint town housed in a converted old movie theater. They had a cute photo op in the lobby, lots of volunteer ushers of all ages, and a cast board with headshots. I saw Once Upon a Mattress, which is a musical reworking of the classic fairy tale, The Princess and the Pea, centered around Winifred, an awkward and eccentric princess. They adapted this 1959 classic musical to have some modern flair to it, and it never felt stuffy, but instead sweetly timeless. The cast was very diverse in not just race, but also body type and age. Their set was truly incredible, with a working fountain and a castle that opened and closed like a storybook. I was also thrilled that PTP featured a full pit band with live music. Uh, Once Upon a Mattress was one of their six main stage plays and musicals and it aligned with the chart by entering, or excuse me, by, by entertaining with diverse talent in cast and crew. I agree with their comment on the chart that, quote, the public desires to see and be entertained by live theater. The crowd was buzzing with excitement and it was clearly valued as an artistic outlet for those involved and a cultural and entertainment experience for those attending. To that same point, PTP is in line with their application as a whole. In accordance with their mission, they, quote, put the performing arts within reach of their community by offering quality productions that are entertaining, educational, and thought-provoking. As mentioned in their creative process, their cast was diverse and talented, which speaks to their diversity efforts. And as described in the sensory or emotional experience section, this show is definitely a feel-good musical. Thank you. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, Vicki, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Yes, I spoke with Mike Gahan, former treasurer, now business manager, Craig Howard, former facilities manager, now treasurer, and Carol Carnock, former membership manager, now secretary of the board. All three were new to their position since the time of grant submission. Mike made a point of saying this theater has been around 75 years and has been following much of the same procedures since then. They established a strategic um, plan committee to come up with a new mission statement and plan, etc. However, to date, there is no plan. The board of directors was recently reestablished. However, it seems that there are the same persons in different roles. Uh, the panel had a question regarding their membership. Um, statement. Membership is a payment of $20 per year, which is required of everyone, actors, front of house, board of directors, anyone connected with or working with the theater. 
Um, if, for example, a designer, a new designer who's never worked with them wants to work on a particular production, they must pay the membership fee to be considered. Um, and as explained, some people pay because they want to work on a particular show and then they never come back. Board members are recruited or selected from within this group of members, um, which means that a member who may have little or limited experience, skills, expertise um, expected for a particular board position, that person would be considered over a non-member professional out in the community. And I asked to explain that to me. Um, and it was confirmed when Craig said that he would be approaching because I said, what do you if you need a specific skill, what do you do? And he said he would be approaching um, out some outside professionals that he had um, for specific skills, but they would be for consultation or assistance for strategic planning purposes. Thank um, you, That's two minutes. Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. Vicki, please feel free to complete your thought there. Yeah, he said that they, the people that were outside professionals would come on um, for a consultation or assistance for strategic planning purposes. And I asked if he had already reached out to any such candidates and he said he would be. Um, in response to the question about their efforts to increase diversity, I was told they wanted to do fences but couldn't get the license. Um, my impression was that this was a group of people who have known each other um, are rather insular and are comfortable with Port Tobacco remaining uh, a rather close-knit community theater. Interesting. I um, My experience was that they took a show that was not necessarily um, written to be very diverse and they made it uh, I thought rather diverse and to speak to their diversity efforts I was actually very impressed that an upcoming show that I saw um, advertised was uh, ragtime and to get the rights to ragtime um, and to be able to do ragtime you have to do it with a very specific uh, um, casting in mind and so there there must be uh, I, I felt like there was a good support from the people that were involved um, for uh, doing what they could with diversity efforts. Vicki, I appreciate what you're saying about how they've uh, changed the structure of the board somewhat. Did they speak to how they're going to evaluate how this new structure is going to be successful? No, they did not. Um, he between the three of them, um, as I said, my my impression was that they have people there who they've worked with, they move around in different positions, and they work through issues and concerns that way. Um, that was my my impression of the conversation. Vicki, were they able to elaborate specifically on how the staffing structure was working well? Um, I don't know if I have any additional notes. I think that what um, Craig said, who is the former facilities manager, now treasurer, um, he said something to the effect that um, with this working from within is how they feel it works, which is one of the reasons why they continue to do this membership. Um, I don't know. I don't know what to call it, but it's for some reason this the membership thing. I They feel that the people that come there pay the membership really want to work with them and that those are the people who will stay and who will grow with them. Um, my, you know, for me, uh, to have someone come and just pay because they want to work on a particular show is problematic. They come and they go. So they have people that come and pay this and they stay. Then they have people that just want to do a show, they come and go. So 
I don't know how you form, how you continue to attract more professionals from other places who want to come and say, you know, why am I paying this twenty dollars? I don't know. It was it to me. It was just it was just a, a strange model. It was something that I, I had never heard of, and it just seemed to me to be um, perhaps a you know, like if you have a, a a a a monthly donor type of thing. That that is some one of the basis for they know that this funding is there. And when he said, "Well, we've been doing this way this way seventy five years," so Thank when they started like four minutes. Thank you. Laura, as a staff discipline expert, do you have any additional information to share? Yeah, thank you so much, panelists. Um, thank you for that discussion uh, and additional details. Um, just a few brief things to that I also wanted to just add in. Um, as, as Amanda said, this is an organization that's in uh, Southern Maryland. Um, so just pointing out that um, this is a, a community that doesn't have a ton of other, you know, theater organizations in the area. So, uh, you know, I, I believe that Port Tobacco Players is uh, really working to fill the needs of the community there through their mission and their programming. Um, thanks for the information about the strategic plan to uh, there, Vicki. I, I did note that they had established a strategic planning committee with a board member as the lead back in 2020. Um, but it says in the application, and as, as you mentioned, it doesn't look like a full strategic plan was established. Um, the team developed and presented a revised mission, vision, and values. Um, so it sounds like portions of a strategic plan were, were put into place, but not an entire long-term plan. So it might be beneficial for um, the organization to consider revisiting that committee and, and formalizing that entire plan to really outline goals and objectives and other benchmarks for, for their future planning. Um, I do, it feels like through, you know, some of their programming choices and other responses that there, there is some self-awareness of what the organization is and what it could be. Um, and they've done some work over the past years in that reflection, um, you know, in terms of thinking about greater diversity and accessibility. I would challenge them to just continue digging deeper into that and thinking about the consideration of non-dominant norms within their storytelling and their programming. Um, and thinking about that, how those stories can show up on their stage. Thanks so much. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now.
and the average final score is 81%. Panelists, before we move on to the next uh, review here, um, Pam, since you're going to be speaking um, as a panelist for artistic activity and in-depth, I just wanted to test your mic and make sure um, things are working okay. It sounded a little choppy still um, the last time you spoke. Could you try uh, just unmuting yourself and speaking a bit? Better video off. Yeah, I think let's try it with the video off. Speaking? Yeah, if you could keep speaking. Oh, I'm so sorry. I will keep speaking. Um, speaking and testing and speaking and testing my video off. Are we doing any better? Otherwise, we could skip and I can Yes, see I think I that's better. Um, you know, I it seems to be all right with the video off. So let's give that a go and I'll and we'll reassess if uh, there's any problem. Thank you. So next, uh, please open application from Potomac Players. Application ID 2024-18183. The average initial score is 84%. The panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, Pam, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. I attended the production gallery, one of four productions offered by Potomac. And I'm so sorry, Pam. An all Pam. volunteer community theater based in Hagerstown. The play was. A yes, if you could try calling in, in your, from your phone, that would be great. Okay. Do you want to go on to the next one and, and double back as a as I kind of catch up. Yeah, uh, Laura, do we want to move on to the next one? If we could and then just return or for just a should moment, we just pause I don't a bit? Think it'll take Pam too long to dial in there. Um, Pam, I just put the dial in information in the chat there if you want to to try that. And we'll just pause here for two moments, two minutes. Hi, is this any better? Can you hear me? Hello. Yes, it does sound better. Good, good, glad to hear it. Thank you. All right, so let's just pick right back up uh, with your artistic activity visit report uh, and you'll have two minutes to share any information gathered. I attended a Sunday matinee production of the Waverly Gallery, one of four main stage productions offered by Potomac Playmakers, an all volunteer community theater based in Hagerstown. The play was a finalist for a Pulitzer Prize in drama. Gladys, the elderly matriarch of the Green family has run an art gallery in a small Greenwich Village hotel for many years. Always offbeat, but now increasingly erratic, Gladys is a cause for concern for her family. In turn, wacky and heartrending, the play considers the effect of dementia on a family. As part of a curated main stage season, the production is a primary method by which the 96-year-old theater 
engages and challenges audiences and future generations of performers and technicians. The organization is aware of the need to build a new generation of leadership among those 40 or younger. The organization seeks to be diverse and realizes its community demographics are far more homogenous than the state as a whole and gives considered thoughts to the ways that it can successfully diversify its artistic offerings. Due to an outbreak of COVID among the cast, the performance I saw was delayed by two weeks. Despite the rescheduling and a sunny day, the house was three quarters full. It was diverse in age, it was enthusiastic and engaged. The organization is undergoing a significant transformation as it adapts to new facilities, thanks to a generous, generous contribution. With the Waverly Gallery's themes of visual arts galleries, Potomac Playmakers partnered with area artists to display and sell art. Other engagement efforts include the successful Rocky Horror Shadow Cast events and neighborhood yard sales. The Waverly Gallery was high quality in all areas, strong acting, excellent script, high caliber production elements, and community engagement. Potomac Playmakers produces quality plays and holds every actor to a high standard of performance. My experience mm -hmm. corresponded with what I found in the application. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, Pam, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. As the Potomac Playmakers nears its 100th year, it's reached a turning point in the organization. Thanks to an estate gift, the theater was able to move from an auditorium in the local women's club where they paid considerable rent and had a lot of scheduling limitations. In 2017, the theater settled on a building, a former church that had many structural amenities that allowed for an easy conversion to a theater but conversion took about a year and a half. Um, a local movie theater donated 130 barely used seats, saving the organization $25,000. The theater generally undertakes renovations as funds and grants allow. Potomac Playmakers opened the space just before COVID forced a closure. The organization took that COVID time to reflect on what this major change meant. Not only did they gain control and flexibility with scheduling but with the move, but it also allowed the organization to help other arts organizations and become more of a community partner. The organization realizes it has a need to engage in more formal planning to catch up on the evolution to the new space. The company's two greatest concerns, attracting and retaining volunteer leadership, and undertaking long-range strategic planning are intertwined. The current board president has reached his term limit and in fact has stayed on to transition the company from the pandemic closures because there's a dearth of leadership to step in. Longtime volunteers are overstretched. The organization not only needs to fill its traditional volunteer positions, but has new needs in, the, in facilities management, rentals, and front of house. Long-term strategic planning that better reflects their new circumstances will happen under the tenure of a new board president. They need to envision themselves as a community partner and an arts center rather than a woman's club renter, which felt like to them performing in mom's basement. It's clear from the site visit that there's a great deal of goodwill for the organization. It attracts and engages a healthy audience. It presents high quality work. It's identified new community partners and it's developed new artistic programs. Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. And I really appreciated the candidness of the responses that the organization provided in the application. Um, they've clearly given a lot of thought to sort of where they've had success, where they're falling short, and where they're going in the future. Uh, I guess my recommendation would be to consider, continue to consider ways to reach yet to be known uh, constituents, uh, not taking for granted that the organization is well known, especially when they're considering how broad they consider their geographic area of service, um, if they want to serve all those areas, and ensuring that, that they're looking at the full geographic area of service when they're considering how their personnel reflects uh, the uh, constituency, um, and to be, as you go into a formal long-term planning process, uh, be thinking about the ways that constituents are able to be authentically involved in decision-making. That and could, um, Pam, do you have information on specifically how constituents are involved in the process, the creative process? It models a lot of the other community theaters where um, membership can bring forward um, and pitch any any kind of um, um, production, and then the leadership balances um, as as best they can for um, 
you know, gender diversity, for diversity of artistic you know, musical versus uh, straight plays. Um, so um, it it is through that it 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 is open to the community, but I but people who are more enmeshed in the in the organization are those who typically will bring by the titles. Do they do anything specific like surveys or something like that to gauge um, constituent input? Do they do what kind of days? Something like surveys um, to seek out as opposed to um, wait for the information to come to them in pitches. I, I'm sorry, I don't remember actually discussing surveys with them and audience feedback, I'm sorry. I might recommend that mm -hmm. Okay. instead of waiting for pitches and things to come in that they uh, reach out into the community with something like a, an open survey for uh, those who are interacting with their organization. The last thing I wanted to point out was, you know, in the application, when they're discussing non-dominant norms, uh, I believe the main focus of their response was on uh, use of profanity. And I appreciate how they reflected how uh, their current attention differs from the past. But there are a lot of different ways that non-dominant norms and values can show up in different kinds of productions that don't necessarily need to be in conflict with the community, its values. Um, but by regularly attending, uh, re regularly thinking about it, it can be a way to bring additional constituents in. Did they have information specific on how on how the staffing structure is particularly successful? Um, I think they would they would call up the close to 100 years of of operating under this. But they, I think that they are, are mixed. It's they, the it is volunteer run and it is a core group of people who've been tapped time and time again. So I, I think that they would say uh, it, quite candidly that they have mixed success that they are looking for an infusion of more staffing more volunteer kind of to spread things among more people thank you panelists that's four minutes thank you laura as a staff discipline expert do you have any additional information to share yeah again thank you so much panelists um again you hit on many of my notes and questions as well so thank you so much for that um, I did just want to lift up that, you know, this is an organization that uh, is in the Western Maryland region, um, you know, and also doesn't have a ton of access to lots of theaters. Um, so, so they are certainly serving an identified need within that geographic area of service um, with a nearly 100 year history, as, as was said here by, uh, by the panelists. Um, there, uh, I did note that they have uh, one of their, their newer um, programming options, the stage door productions has seems to have a less structured decision making process, but that allows for some more experimentation by individual artists. Um, so that might be something to explore, you know, in, in the future and how how that decision making process can involve more voices. Um, as, as was said here, um, there doesn't appear to be a formalized long-term um, planning process uh, utilized, though there has been some recent interest in developing this. Um, so with the new space and the increased opportunities for programming, I would strongly encourage that the organization consider some sort of formalized long-term plan to help lead them in their decision-making for, um, for both the short-term and the long-term. Um, with the new space, there's also some need for increased staffing to effectively run that space in the organization, which Pam also spoke to. Um, and again, that long-term planning process could aid in formulating these goals and strategies and benchmarks to increase the staffing so that it matches um, what the capacity of the organization is now. Um, they did note in their application that the, it, the organization is in a predominantly white area of the state. Um, I would encourage them to, you know, dig deeper into the ideas of um, what diversity could look like for that organization, you know, it, it, beyond just racial demographics, considering other, you know, means of, of looking at diversity, age, gender, income, ability levels, um, all of that 
you know, and how that's showing up in the organization, I think is important to note. Um, and David, I had the exact same notes that you did about um, about non-dominant norms and, um, you know, that uh, profanity and adult content is not exactly equal to, um, to non-dominant norms. They used examples of including plays such as Proof and Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf in recent years, which are pretty standard um, contemporary American theater works. So I would uh, recommend that they dig a little deeper into what the non-dominant norms are and how that can show up on their stage and in their programming. Thanks so much. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now. And the average final score is 85%. Panelists, I just want to check in on the time. It is now 12.02. Um, we could either take the break right now and return at 12.17, uh, or we can try and get one more in. Uh, but that might mean that we'll start the break a little bit later than uh, when we had anticipated. Could you let me know if you have a preference? I'm cool to do Puppet Co, but I can also break if that's what everybody else wants to do. And find another way. Yeah. Yeah, I'm good either way. All right. Um, well, if everyone's good either way, then uh, let's do one more. All right. Please open application from Puppet Co. Application ID 2024-18825. The average initial score is 91%. The panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, David, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Thank you, Kathy. I attended a performance of Sleeping Beauty, one of the main stage legacy performances produced by the Puppet Co. at Glen Echo in Montgomery County. The short production for all ages featured three professional puppeteers telling the story of a resentful fairy who curses a beloved princess with a gallant prince who saves the day and all live happily ever after. Uh, the performance appealed to multiple generations of audience members on several levels. 
There are references that likely only the adults recognize, such as the statement that it's the princess's party and she can cry if she wants to, as well as humor derived from intentional repetition, where young audience members learn about classic comedy rhythms with their roots in Commedia dell'arte. The performance was a slower, more intimate, and more communal experience compared to a television or a film comedy. The young people in the audience uh, were responsive and emotional, and there was a mutual understanding that this was a space where all could express themselves freely and free of judgment. Uh, because the scripts for these legacy productions were crafted by the company, they've been able to make sensible updates to the dialogue over time and experiment with adjustments while maintaining and keeping in use the beloved and distinctive puppets that were created by the founders. The director of this performance was a performer in a prior version of the Playhouse, and the team was able to learn from feedback and responses to determine how to improve the show. Part of the mission of the Puppet Co. is to celebrate both the visual appeal and storytelling capacity of puppetry, which was evident from the presentation. The collection of puppets is kept at the Playhouse, and many of them are on display in the lobby. The Puppet Co. strives to elicit audience delight through puppetry, and the audience was audibly delighted. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, Amanda, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Puppetry specifically addresses their mission above other theatrical forms because it uniquely allows anyone to see themselves represented in the puppet, which can do things that people cannot. Children relate to puppets differently than human actors, and on a broader scale, puppets generally inspire in a different way, allowing the audience to lose themselves. There are clear wants and needs for the legacy productions. Some shows have an almost cult-like following where generations will fondly remember productions and want to return regularly, especially once they have new family members to introduce to the material. They are not remounting the exact same productions though. Instead, they are addressing problematic parts of these stories like consent and sleeping beauty, but keeping the essence of those legacy productions. The puppets look and feel challenge dominant norms in theater because puppets can be anything, they are universal, and anyone can be the puppeteer. In the last year, they have hired more non-binary or female identifying folks than ever before and taken away typecasting. For example, Jack and the Beanstalk will feature two female puppeteers where the roles of Jack and the Giant have always been men. Regarding fabrication, toxic materials were used for the founder's original puppets. Now they have eliminated toxicity and use greener methods. More paper mache, clay sculpting, foam carving, polyurethane casting, wood, metal, and anything else that can eliminate waste. Regarding their traditional marketing, they have used very little at all, which was mostly just postcards in the lobby or a nearby park. Now they create posters, flyers, and social media like Facebook, Instagram, and TikTok. They are aiming for television spots like morning shows and possible virtual elements. Their original strategic plan was presented in a pre-pandemic world. Now, long-term decision-making will happen using a three to five year rolling basis, constantly evaluating how programs are doing. Looking ahead for the next few years, they want to focus on doing everything they did in 2022 better and more effectively and readjust the original five-year plan, especially for aspects like touring. Thank you. Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. I just want to note that Pam stated a conflict of interest, so Pam will not be participating in the discussion and scoring. I would like to just add that this was one of the easiest, most chill conversations I had um, with uh, their different representatives. And it was like show and tell because they all managed to have puppets wherever they were um, and they were not all in the same location and so they were all able to pull them aside or parts of puppets because sometimes I saw like something that wasn't quite yet whatever it was going to be and so you could see um, what they were doing and what they were making and how um, intricate and different from the legacy puppets uh, that the newer versions were. They um, are less uh, European centric, uh, less blonde and blue eyed, uh, more, uh, they have a, a mix of different complexions and, and characteristics and features. Um, you can see how they're moving things more diversely uh, going forward. I think it's really well taken. I thought they did a really good job of conveying sort of the strategies that they have in mind to uh, amplify their diversities in a lot of different ways. Uh, my recommendation would be uh, to think about how you're formally collecting that data and how, well, how you'll be able to track over time what strategies are most successful, what is the impact, um, and so what is the effect on the audience overall. David, did you, um, you said you saw Sleeping Beauty. Did you did. happen to uh, notice 
the way that they tackled consent in the absolutely I, I i only got into that vaguely in my presentation the idea it isn't uh the classic sleeping beauty story had the prince sort of walking in abhorring the ugly fairy and going straight to sleeping beauty and kissing her and it, the thing that i was talking about with the artistic director it's just not necessary to the success of the story um now he initially thinks that the fairy who cursed her is actually sleeping beauty and it's this moment of confusion. Oh, that's not the person I'm looking for. And then she is able to find Sleeping Beauty and awaken her without having to engage in a kiss. That is not, it's not a romance. It's not, this is a first time meeting. Um, and this is really sort of cognizant of how are we presenting romantic stories to children and presenting, uh, how to take a classic story and bring it to uh, make it, it's, to teach the lessons that we want to be teaching in 2023. I also found it really interesting that they have certain legacy productions that they have deemed um, retired. The, they are flat out just, they've evaluated them and because of the look and feel of the puppets or because of the storylines, they have just deemed that these legacy productions uh, served their purpose in their time, but they do not in 2023 and beyond. And so um, they are looking for new ways to incorporate new stories and they still have certain legacy productions that they return to over and over again. Um, they had great information about how they use uh, authentic voices. So they have, uh, I think the title is called Herschel and the Hanukkah Goblins, but it was written with um, authentic voicing from Jewish folks and that they are looking at maybe uh, having a Native American puppeteer who is well known in the industry from out west come, but they only want to do a native production if they have somebody that can speak to that voice authentically um, come and visit and, and help them build that production. <laughs> I was also really impressed. So, you know, uh, they talked about how Alice in Wonderland was a production they had formerly created as a legacy production. Uh, it's no longer in the repertoire. The puppets actually were dismantled. Um, but they heard from audiences that that was a production that they were really excited about. It performed the highest on the survey that they did about what story they're, they're interested in. And so they're actually creating an all new Alice in Wonderland for, I believe it's going to be premiered next year. It might be this fall, I forget now. Um, but they're really guiding, using the audience interest and excitement uh, to, to guide their decision making in a really proactive way. Thank you, that's four minutes. Thank you. Laura, as a staff discipline expert, do you have any additional information to share? Um, just a few brief things. Thank you so much, uh, David and Amanda, for your reports uh, and comments there. Um, I did just want to note that uh, there was a planned leadership change in 2020, and they used that kind of opportunity coupled with the pandemic closure to really reaffirm their mission. Um, uh the as you know as both reports were sharing there's kind of the legacy productions and the new plays now moving forward and the new plays um are being written by a blend of internal and external artists inviting new voices into the process so i think that's a really important thing to to pull out um and thank you so much for the information too on the legacy productions and how those are being um evaluated and maybe retired in some in some uh instances um there are organizational goals that are uh, are very clear and set and these were a part um there was also a discussion of a transition plan that was presented by the new artistic director so i think that that's kind of working as their long-term plan at the moment um staff capacity seems to be a real challenge and they have made some shifts in roles to help address burnout um but they that might be something to consider in their future planning about what that um staffing structure looks like and considering um within a long-term plan how to get to you know a, a staffing uh structure that fully suits the organization um i loved hearing amanda about the way that um that you mentioned how the puppets can really challenge dominant norms in theater and uh, you know how that representation can come across 
that was really great to hear. Um, I did also want to mention that the organization has sensory friendly family performances offered. Um, and just as Amanda um, mentioned at the end there, they have utilized uh, Jewish folk tales and stories as a basis of their storytelling. And, you know, I would just encourage them to continue, you know, digging into different um, cultures and different um, ways to tell those stories, um, different non Eurocentric folk tales and legends and other things that could be the basis of their their puppet storytelling in the future. Thanks so much. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now. And the average final score is 95%. All right, panelists, we're going to pause here now for a 15-minute break. So if we could all return at 1231, we'll see you back here at 1231. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy.
All right. The time is now 1231. Uh, panelists, if you can turn on your videos. Hey, David. Hey, Amanda, Vicki. And let's see, is Pam back? I don't believe so. We'll just hold a moment for Pam. All right, looks like Pam is back with us. All right, wonderful. We are almost there, panelists. You're doing a fabulous job. Almost there. All right, let's proceed with the next review. Please open application from Rockville Musical Theater. Application ID 2024. 18792. The average initial score is 65%. The panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, David, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Thank you, Kathy. I attended a performance of the musical adaptation of Raoul Dahl's James and the Giant Peach, produced by Miracle Musical Theater at the Gaithersburg Arts Barn in Montgomery County. After the precocious young James's parents are devoured by a rhinoceros, he is sent to live with his wicked aunts in Dover, where he brews a magic potion that inadvertently creates the titular fruit. Alongside a group of human-sized talking insects, James and the Peach travel all the way to New York City. The treacherous aunts are vanquished, and all live happily ever after. With an original score by Benj Pasek and Justin Paul, the musical preserves the high stakes and macabre appeal of the original novel, while incorporating creative songs and theatrical flourishes that scintillate the audience's imagination. Cast members frequently left the stage to come to the aisles, ask questions, and celebrate with the families in the audience. After the show, children are welcome to remain to meet the actors. Game of the Giant Peach has proven its enduring entertainment value and enrichment to audiences in the 60 years since it originated, and RMT has engaged local volunteer actors to perform it. A variety of objects were cleverly used to convey the wide range of items, characters, and places that the script required. The bug characters also shared several facts about their species in the performance, which informed and enriched the young learners in the audience. The show asks audiences to empathize with James as he defies the wishes of his cruel aunts, shows uh, bravery in uh, challenging situations, and uses his wit to find creative solutions to his problems. To tell an imaginative story like this requires collaboration, interdependence, and trust among the members of the company. And as a result, RMT was able to produce a high quality theatrical experience for its audience. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, Pam, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Rockville Musical Theater is a volunteer-run community theater approaching its 50th anniversary. It long ago split from its sister organization, Rockville Little Theater, to exclusively focus on musicals, while the other is devoted to straight plays. RMT receives funding from the city of Rockville and is a resident company receiving discounted rental fees to present two productions and receives strong advertising support. Uh, RMT is also presents the third more experimental and risky production at Gaithersburg Arts Barn. About 40% of the organization's budget is devoted to rental expenses. RMT's board is now mostly millennials. Attracting and onboarding diverse leadership is a priority. With events of 2020 and the racial reckoning, RMT considers what it does community, what, do, what does community theater really mean? RMT feels strongly about accessibility. RMT contracted a DEI consultant who reviewed most front-facing documents, such as audition and casting notices. Plus, she is now sitting in on the audition process. She ensures that the language says what the organization really wants to convey and to invite a diverse um, audition base. 
Next to come is reworking the board information and guide to operations. These documents are outdated. RMT is aware that there is a cost to do what is essentially an artistic hobby. They started a scholarship fund to subsidize expenses ranging, uh, ranging from transportation to theatrical makeup. They want to encourage diversity and remove barriers to participation. RMT is looking to present a uni universal and diverse stories. They put an all call on social media and through email listservs to anyone who has ever had a touch point with the organization, and they'll receive an invitation to submit production ideas. RMT wants to create an infrastructure that works. Presenting plays is under control. Their key priority is about creating an effective and equitable organization. Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. Thank you, Pam. Did they address long-term or strategic planning uh, in their uh, in-depth conversation at all? I think you're on mute, Pam. Pam, uh, I think you were muted if you want to try try again. Um, my notes are really more of a rolling out the the DEI stages that they that they had as opposed to other aspects of the um, long range planning. Thank you. I guess the recommendation then would be that to uh, be thinking about a formal or long-term planning idea that would be able to bring in stakeholders. That's also an opportunity to be thinking about, you know, in addition to people who have had touch point with Rockwell Musical Theater before, who are different stakeholders that can come in and how can musical theater be appealing to a really broad swath of the population. And the other recommendation that's paired with that is uh, a recommendation to cons more regularly consider a broader way of non-dominant norms and values and uh, be proactive in thinking about the ways that the uh, company incorporates risk into their operations. Did they uh, specifically address how their staffing reflects the population for the geographic area of service with any uh, demographic data uh age um that they that they tend to skew younger um their millennial uh, millennial board um i think they are still um less diverse than the the area and they're they're kind of it's almost like you know steering a aircraft carrier they're making incremental changes as they can Focusing first on um, on the additional calls and um, and a lot of the casting notices and and working from, you know, inviting inviting people onto the stage and into the artistic process um, to begin. I would recommend that their uh, that their response include whatever um, demographic population information that they can and in data what even if it doesn't show where they want to be, but it shows where they are right now, just so that we have some sort of data to, to go off of, for starter. I should say also in the conversation, they um, they referenced uh, We See You White American Theater and used that they found it very affecting and uh, used it as a jumping off point for a lot of their um, a lot of their work beginning in 2020. I think that points to as well. So this is an organization that has definitely considered its vision, its goals, and its values. And so that first question is an opportunity to say that in addition to the mission, um, that to be able to go into a little bit more depth, not just sort of what is the broadest goal, but more specific goals and laying those out in a really clear way. And in referencing back to my notes from the conversation, the, the current strategic plan was written post pandemic um, and informed in a great deal about their relationship with the city of Rockville. That that really does inform a lot since so much of their funding is is rental, that, that relationship with the, with the space owner, um, you know, it, it informs a lot of their strategic planning. Thank you, panelists. That's four minutes. Thank you. Laura is a staff discipline expert. Do you have any additional information to share? 
Yeah, just to um, David, your question about strategic planning and Pam actually just alluded to it as well. But just to clarify, they, they do have a current long term strategic plan uh, that's outlined in B2 of the application um, and that brings them uh, through to the next four to five years, it says. Um, it doesn't give a lot of detail in terms of how it was developed, but there are four specific goals that are outlined there. So just wanted to make sure that those were highlighted. Um, other notes that I have, um, I just, yeah, uh, sorry, I'm just <laughs> just skimming through them real quick to make sure that everything was covered. Um, I did want to uplift that they have created a mentorship program to help address uh, the lack of technical volunteers. That was an address need that they had. So they've developed this program to hopefully, you know, develop kind of a pipeline of new technical volunteers to help address those needs. Um, Going back to that strategic planning question, um, like I said, the goals are mentioned, but there isn't a lot of detail about how it was developed. Um, so I would recommend some further details there, though, Pam, it's, it's uh, good to know about how the city uh, was a part of that and what they were considering. Um, there just there seems to be, you know, as through this conversation and through what was in the application itself, some awareness and acknowledgement that the board and the staff and the artists don't reflect the racial makeup of the community. Um, but they, I, I would like to know more about the specific steps and the initiatives that they are taking to address this. Knowing more about the hired consultant is is helpful. I didn't really know what their role was entirely, so it's it's helpful to know what that consultant did and what they are doing now. Um, and finally, just as as David recommended, I would recommend also that they uh, consider further into those non-dominant norms within musical theater. Um, they mentioned a production of Into the Woods, which I would consider pretty standard musical theater canon. Um, there, you know, talk of non-traditional casting, which of course can be a step, but I would encourage them to dig a little bit deeper into those non-dominant norms and how they are showing up on their stage. Thanks so much. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now.
and the average final score is 68%. Next, please open application from Roundhouse Theater, application ID 2024-17568. The average initial score is 94%. The panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, David, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Thank you, Kathy. I watched a recorded version of Roundhouse Theater's recent production of William Shakespeare's The Tempest, directed by Aaron Posner and Teller of Penn and Teller fame. The Tempest centers on the sorcerer Prospero, the rightful Duke of Milan, who causes his usurping brother Antonio and associates to be shipwrecked on the island where he had been exiled. By the time the play is concluded, Prospero has been returned to power, made amends with Antonio, and seen his daughter Miranda fall in love with Ferdinand, Prince of Naples. The production is especially notable for its highly creative staging. While the script always described Prospero's magical prowess, in this production, Prospero and the spirit Ariel, Ariel uh, executed a variety of breathtaking illusions devised by Teller, Johnny Thompson, and Nate Dendy. Caliban, described in the script as monstrous, is portrayed by two actors with acrobatic choreography, often speaking in unison. Frequent musical interludes performed live punctuate the story, advance the action, and convey the mysterious atmosphere. One of the highest grossing productions in their history, this inventive production and its modern interpolations undoubtedly introduced a notable Shakespearean work to many who might not have immediately found Shakespeare appealing. This show is also made available to classrooms across the country at no cost for use in educational settings. Part of Roundhouse's annual production series and produced in association with Folger Theater, the production featured a diverse cast of primarily local actors. Roundhouse seeks to inspire empathy and a story of a man who begins out for revenge and comes to make amends with those who have wronged him provides audiences with an opportunity to reflect and consider the nature of resentment and forgiveness. Roundhouse strives to be a theater for everyone, producing a work like The Tempest in such a way that it can be appealing and comprehensible to a wide variety of audiences demonstrates how they achieve this goal. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, David, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Thank you, Kath. For my in-depth conversation with Roundhouse Theater, I met with Ed Zakreski, Managing Director, Veronica Cannon, Director of Development, and Ro Body, Resident Artist. In 2019, Roundhouse convened board and staff members to develop a newly focused mission and vision to be a theater for everyone with experiences that inspire empathy and demand conversation. While they had to pivot to virtual programming in 2020, the work they did to build consensus on the organization's direction enabled them to respond quickly and attentively. They've been working to diversify the full-time staff by finding new and creative places to advertise positions on social media, increasing word of mouth, having the EDIA workgroup actively review each job description, and retaining search consultants when needed to ensure all candidate pools are diverse. Roundhouse receives feedback and input on the creative process from the public via surveys, other organizational partners, and a patron development committee of community members that meets bi-monthly to provide candid feedback. For season planning, ideas have come from many different sources, full-time staff, students in their education programs, projects pitched by associate artists, as well as regular patrons. Artists serve the organization in many ways, including as performers, artisans, technicians, educators, board members, and donors. Volunteers are primarily managed by the patron experience and rentals manager and serve in front of house functions. Their Emeritus Trustee Council was formed after the organization implemented term limits for the board to provide former trustees with a way to remain engaged. While the council has no formal decision-making role, they maintain relationships with other board and staff members through regular events and activities. Roundhouse is making great strides to realize its bold and admirable mission to be a theater for everyone, advance equity, and serve its community. Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. David, could you run down one more time about constituent involvement in the creative process? I heard you, um, I believe, talking about artists and pitching ideas, or but I was also Absolutely. taking notes. Yeah, and I can go into a little depth if any of these uh, would have more. Ideas come from a lot of different sources. When I ask that question, sort of how are different constituents involved? You know, there are certainly full-time staff members who pitch projects. Some of the most exciting projects they have coming up were pitched by associate artists who are not full-time staff members, but they're artists in the community uh, who have this idea and that really percolates. 
they do do regular surveys to be able to understand and they get feedback from the patron development committee to understand not just sort of like what's the title that should be doing but what's the program that should be happening uh, they, i was also really excited to hear that the students in the education programs talk with the staff members and that gets them excited about certain ideas about what can be presented on the stage and then be happening in the education programs as well as the, the play that they regularly commission uh, the part of the well, significant part of their work right now is commissioning new work um, and a, a real commitment to ensuring that uh, the canon that's be, is being expanded by the uh, projects being commissioned uh, and then i'm trying to think of were there any others um, as well as regular patrons, sometimes providing ideas that uh, are able to uh, be snowball into a larger uh, artistic project. Panelists, are there additional questions, thoughts, recommendations? If not, Laura, as a staff discipline expert, do you have any additional information to share? Thank you so much, David, for your reports and overview there. Um, I, I found this to be a, a very thorough application. Um, so I just wanted to highlight a couple of things that, um, that really stood out to me. Um, their mission and their strategic plan have really driven their organizational goals. Uh, there's a clear commitment to highlighting voices that are often under-resourced in American theater. Um, they're commissioning 30 plays in 10 years by playwrights who identify as women, trans, non binary and people of color. Um, one of their uh, kind of exciting programs that they offer is the On the House program, which offers free tickets through partnerships with other nonprofits. Um, as David outlined, there is a very clear decision making process um, and those organizational goals are driving those decisions. Uh, they recently completed a strategic planning process that will bring them through FY26. Um, and decision making and planning appears to be very much in alignment with that strategic plan. Um, they've recently created some new staff roles to address some challenges and to better serve the organization as a whole. Um, they have a very clear description of budgeting processes and they strategically plan to use their FY21 surplus for projected deficits in FY22 and 23. Um, and just overall, there feel, feels like there is regular consideration of non-dominant norms in their programming as part of their mission. Um, that's everything, thank you. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click Complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now.
and the average final score is 96%. Next, please open application from Silhouette Stages, Inc., application ID 2024-18187. The average initial score is 88%. The panelist that conducted the artistic activity visit, Vicki, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Vicki, if you're speaking, we're unable to hear you. Sorry. Unfortunately, I was unable to visit in person, so I requested um, Jeremy Goldman, the board president and director of the current show, to submit some videos. And he sent several of past performances. He submitted YouTube links to promos as well as full performances uh, for The Wedding Singer, Cinderella, and The Lightning Thief. The first um, and third, the Wedding Singer and Lightning Thief are shown on their listed activity chart. Cinderella was an older show, but I think that it would be listed in the same place on the chart. All three productions were main stage. The Wedding Singer, which is scheduled to open, um, I was able to view promos and rehearsals. The promos were done to a very high quality and you could see from the rehearsals that was a well thought out, well directed um, production. It was clear that there was a large cast involved. I was able to view for the other two productions um, from the video sets, lights and costumes, which were quite good and very professionally done. Um, the, their house seemed to accommodate a good size audience although I wasn't able to actually see the house from the videos. Uh, all three shows were family friendly. The Lightning Thief um, was multicultural. It appears that attention is paid to all aspects of their productions and my experience, my viewing experience, supported the narrative in the grant that they are working to do full-fledged and product, uh, professional productions. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, Vicki, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Yes, I met with Jeremy Goldman, president of the board. Um, he's worked with the theater and been on the board for several years and assumed the president's role in 2015. He noted in the past the theater had a reputation of not being inclusive. And he said that the, their community advisory committee will take it over the hurdle. While the grant says newly formed, it didn't sound like the group has actually been finalized. He said it will be made up of ticket holders, performers, technical folk, persons from Wild Lake Village Board. Uh, he determined who they will approach, but he has not begun that process. Uh, they had a retreat attended by 12 board members and it addressed the lack of understanding that board members had about their roles and responsibilities. New bylaws were written defining the roles and establishing the role of a, uh, artistic director for the first time. There was a question uh, from the panel of what plans are in place to reach new and yet to be known constituents. And I also added constituents and board members because the board is 90% white, 9% black, and they're in Columbia. Um, it was what are they going to do beyond the programmatic choices? Uh, Jeffrey said they're looking for different types of programs. He noted that during COVID, they had screened a film about an African-American youth dealing with gun violence. Uh, They'd never done screenings in this program in partnership with uh, a Moms Against Violence group was something new to them. I asked about the makeup of the board with so few black directors. And he said it was a concern. And I asked if they had ever reached out to um, local organizations and businesses, and he didn't really respond directly. Uh, the process for developing an annual budget is outlined in the grant narrative. Regarding production budgets, in the past, the production's director submitted a budget to the board, and the board would approve or revise until there was an agreement. Now, the board submits the production budget for production to the director for approval. Thank and you, Vicki. That's two minutes. 
Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. Please feel free to complete your thought there, Vicki. Uh, Jeremy said that this, this new process works because board members are all creatives, many of whom have directed at the theater in the past, and they understand the territory, meaning they, you know, they know how much a show will cost. Next year, all three directors, however, will be from the outside, so they may need to re revisit this process. Vicki, could you um, could you let me know if they uh, had addressed how the staffing structure was particularly successful? Uh, the staffing structure is now more successful because board members know their roles and staff have been taken have taken ownership of their duties. Um, there's one open position, the grant fundraiser, which they want to fill. Um, and I'm, I might also add that regarding the board, I, I just found it quite odd that in Colombia they they couldn't find um, black African Americans, people of color, for the board. And I asked him if he was familiar with um, organizations that help to facilitate onboarding um, blacks and people of color. And he he didn't know. I asked him was he aware of the associate associated black charities, which is that is what they do. And he said that, um, no, he wasn't aware of that. He hadn't heard of it and that he would perhaps reach out to them. So would you say that like through their board retreat and things, that's what helped facilitate their understanding of their roles more, which has led to a more successful structure? Are you saying that, that the retreat helped Yeah, them? like understand what they should be doing in the structure, yes. Okay. I think it's a good point, Amanda, especially, I, I guess my recommendation would be to consider additional indicators to assess if the staff structure is successful. Revising the bylaws is a really good step in that direction. Taking retreat, taking time to learn better about what is the responsibility is a really good step. And then being able to reflect then, we, we, we've tried this, does that improve the operations of the organization, the finances, the uh, operations, yeah. Yeah, I agree with David about how um, uh, the the understanding your roles and the staffing structure and and having clarity in that. Um, I, I'm not sure which came first, the chicken or the egg. I'm not sure whether the the retreat um, can you know helped them narrow down what their different staff roles were or. Uh, whatever, uh, but I just, I'm glad that they're moving in that direction, finding more clarity, narrowing their focus on their different roles, um, but a little bit more information on um, other metrics on how they deem success in those roles and how it's working or not working would be helpful. I think that dovetails really neatly with sort of the finding more detail in the strategies to reach. You have to be known constituents, you have to be involved participants, you have to be involved board members. That uh, when you know what you're doing, you have more capacity to bring others in to also know what they're doing. And so I think that is, uh, it sounds like they have, are thinking about planning in a, uh, in a cohesive way. And this, those are all things that come about uh, when you're able to do so successfully. Thank you, panelists. That's four minutes. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now. Hey, Kathy, I have to I have to chime in for a second. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <That's> okay. <laughs> I don't I don't have too much to add, so I will be brief. Uh, everyone really hit on my on my notes uh, and comments already. So um 
But um, yeah, just just to echo um, what what Vicky was discussing, you know, this is an organization in in Howard County in the Columbia area. So really making sure that um, the organization is fully reflective of the community, um, I think is an important thing. It seems like there's some steps in place and that some things are happening. So I would encourage them to really kind of double down on that and consider that for their their future planning. Um, that new community advisory committee, I think could be a really important step in that. Um, that's being put into place in FY24, the application said. So, so that might be, you know, that kind of, uh, you know, impetus for that, that next step. Um, I think it's, it's great that they've done things like the board retreat and finding out about the new bylaws. That's, you know, those are all really great steps as they, they continue to refine their processes. Um, they mentioned that retaining volunteers is an ongoing challenge um, and they've worked to address that by naming a volunteer coordinator um, and also considering volunteer appreciation strategies. So I think that was you know, a good way of noticing a challenge and, and then addressing it through some, some actions. Um, as, as Vicki talked about the, the shows um, that she, she referenced, I think they're pretty, you know, fairly standard in musical theater repertoire. So I, I would encourage them to, you know, dig a little bit more into non-dominant norms, um, you know, and, and how those are showing up in their programming throughout the year. Um, I made a note that I think that this organization is, I'm going to lovingly refer to it as in its teenage years. I think it's moving away from being this kind of group of friends that puts on theater to a more formalized nonprofit organization. So it feels like there's lots of thoughtful work and steps that are happening. And I would just encourage them to keep going down that path. Okay, now you can score. Thank you. <laughs> You'll get to hear this from me again based on the information gathered from the discussion. Please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now. and the average final score is 86%. Next, please open application from Silver Spring Stage, application ID 2024-18701. The average initial score is 74%. 
The panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, Pam, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Silver Spring Stage is a Montgomery County-based all-volunteer community theater that aspires to present theater that's both entertaining and thought-provoking and to engage its community on stage, backstage, and in its audiences. I attended the production Men on Boats, which depicts an 1869 river expedition in Western United States, and it's based on the actual journals of pioneering explorers. And while the historical figures in there were all cisgender white males, the cast portraying them was made up of entirely of people who were not. And as the theater states, the play bridges the gap between then and now in ways that highlight the arrogance of Western colonizers while recognizing their bravery and bravery and fearlessness. The theatrical dissonance between the performer and the role allows for comedy, commentaries, and satire as we reconsider history. And I thought it was a fascinating um, selection. The cast was really strong and diverse. Um, the production elements were very striking and effective, and the performance date was actually rescheduled due, due to COVID, um, and the theater did an excellent job informing the ticketed patrons and making new accommodations, although it was um, a, a little lean in, that, in the house. Um, the narrative states that the company will soon be shut out of their current artistic home and will seek to produce in an alternative venue. The construction that's referenced really creates barriers for audiences, um, both outside and within the facility, and it makes it difficult to attract and serve all but really the most stalwart uh, attendees. The physical barriers um, really don't affect, uh, don't reflect the commitment to be inclusive to all, which would certainly include people with disabilities and limited mobility. Um, the company recognizes this and references their facility issues as one of their greatest challenges. This aside, my artistic site visit affirmed the company's mindful commitment to diversity and inclusion in their season um, and their desire to present work that's both compelling and entertaining. They really, they're at, they aspire to really high uh, artistic quality. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, Amanda, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Silver Spring Stage is seeing how they could adjust, not formally revise the mission and vision, especially in light of the construction in their space, canceled and moved shows and upcoming leadership changes. They are recruiting for the board and many of the candidates would increase diversity. They adjusted the current season to maintain programming. As of March 3rd, they moved one show into next season's first slot, salvaged another by moving it to a new venue in the same April timeframe, and were planning a show at another venue to finish the season. They were preparing to put a call out for directors and projects for an abbreviated one-act festival in August, which was their anticipated return to the space. Further, they spaced next season's shows so that they could start later in the fall. The play reading committee is currently folded into the board, but most of the plays from the last three years during the pandemic were pre-vetted, having gone through the PRC process. They were alternates, runners-up, or recommended shows that the board ultimately didn't select. Between canceled productions and this pool of shows, they had plenty of repertoire, all of which were selected with the vision, mission, goals, and values in mind. Looking ahead, they have asked directors for submissions and ideas, allowing constituent input. Regarding personnel challenges and burnout, they are planning a town hall style meeting in May to discuss the future and sustainability of the organization and hopefully drum up interest in and a commitment to leadership. They're also looking at hiring a halftime executive director who would also handle grants and a halftime facilities manager, alleviating some burden on leadership. It's a significant add on to the budget, but by having employees, they could apply for even more grants and allow for more venue rentals. They have discussed finding a new space when the ceiling was literally collapsing in on them. They looked at other venues, even using a real estate agent, but found nothing else that they could afford, especially given that their rent is so far under the market. They ultimately did not want to relocate, having strong ties to their intimate space and the community that they serve in Eastern Montgomery County as Silver Spring Stage. Thank you. Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. Thank you both. I wonder if you either of you want to speak to uh, a little bit more in depth on their sensory and emotional impact. The answer in the application was primarily uh, describing the shows that they are presenting. And I think it sounds like they had a, a good deal of attention to sensory and emotional impacts in uh, each of your extension assignments. Um, I mean, I thought the, the text was really uh, very thoughtful and cohesive with the production elements. Um, they do a lot with a, a, a little space, a lot of, really a lot of bang for their buck. Um, it does reflect 
um, a, a lot of thought and cohesion among various decision makers. I got the sense from them that they were, you know, like many other theater companies, they're, they are choosing a wide selection of shows to invoke all the different kinds of emotions that one can have when they go to the theater, whether it's entertainment or, um, you know, pure comedy or something that is very thought provoking, um, very dramatic, whatever the case may be. Um, did, I, I don't know if that helped, David. <laughs> Yeah, I think so. I think it, uh, it, and it's interesting to think about when you have these shows uh, that there's a real variety, and then what then the audience response is. And I really appreciate Pam how you were able to take in this show and how it changed your thinking and excited you and Amanda and getting to think about and serve their community and what the the impact they want to have in that area. I really appreciate you both. Um, I did get. Um, I have like pages of notes for my meeting with them. They were uh, really engaging and they're trying so hard uh, to, um, there's been really long-term leadership from what I have gauged um, is that they have folks who have been involved in the, the top of the board um, for quite some time. And they are trying to get the next generation of people to become those people to step into leadership roles and take responsibility at this time meeting so they're trying really hard to build um uh, sustainability and and people to draw in as leaders uh for the next phase of silver spring stage while hopefully also returning to a rehabilitated space that is um that has a ceiling i mean and is functional um they are working really hard on trying to address accessibility issues um they know that right now it's they're working on things in their in their space but um i have never seen people be more in love with their space particularly um they were talking very um excitedly very fervently with true love for their little intimate space um they said that for the same amount of money that they currently pay to have this theater that they would that they keep year round um they would probably have to pay more to rent space at other venues and it and it would then if they were going to other places they didn't feel like they would be silver spring stage and they feel like they're in a place where they really want to serve the, a, a community that they felt is underserved perhaps um in other ways and so they really want to remain where they are and do what they can in their space and try to you know perhaps with these new positions that they're looking at having they might be able to do some different rentals and things to help bolster um you know uh funds coming in from different sources and things too And one more note about the play reading committee. It seems as though that they are planning to get back to the play reading committee um, once they find some sense of normalcy again. Uh, once they have, you know, this season was a bit odd because of the construction and also kind of really coming out of the worst effects of COVID. But once they return to a sense where they are on solid ground again, and they've they've really used the the last of the certain shows that they had sort of had those pre-vetted shows um they want to return to using the play reading committee they want to return to getting um that uh, constituent input from other folks uh that's their hope thank you panelists that's four minutes thank you laura as a staff discipline expert do you have any additional information to share um, just a few brief notes. Thank you so much, panelists, on that. Um, I did just want to note that they um, somewhat recently, I believe, uh, developed uh, a set of principles uh, that have helped to broaden the scope of the mission and their work overall. And they also adapted um, a new code of conduct. Um, so just two things to, to highlight that they've recently worked on. Um, and I think, Amanda, I think you said this, that, that in the coming year, they're going to be reassessing their mission and their business plan. And of course, with all of the, you know, changes that come with the, the building and the performance space, you know, there's a, a huge opportunity for that for both the short term planning and then the long term effects on the organization. Um, I am glad to hear. Um, from you, Amanda, that they they do have some things that are in the works that they're considering different places and different options, um, you know, because I know that was a, a big question mark. And um, I think the town hall idea that you mentioned is is a great way for them to engage with their community and to really get that that hopefully that impact or excuse me that um, input 
uh, for their consideration of goals and plans for the future. Um, their application did share that the, um, the, the, I believe it's the current season, they said the most recent season centered um, Black stories, Middle Eastern stories, and immigrant stories. Um, so I think that there is that clear consideration of diversity and non-dominant uh, voices represented on their stage. Thank you. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now. And the average final score is 77%. Panelists, I just wanted to check in with you about break time. We had initially scheduled one after this uh, review. Um, however, we are running uh, way ahead of schedule. So I wanted to check in and see if you want to keep proceeding until we get closer to um, 155 is, is around when we were anticipating a break. Do you want to continue or take a break now? I'm inclined to continue. Okay. Good. Mm -hmm. We can continue. Great. All right. Then we will move forward. Please open application from the British players. Application ID 2024-18616. The average initial score is 76%. The panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, David, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Thank you, Kathy. I attended a rehearsal of the British Players production of William Shakespeare's As You Like It, performed at Kensington Town Hall in Montgomery County. 
The production is helmed by Fred Zerm, who's directed the piece three times before and has infused the production with a Woodstock theme. Several other characters dress and speak in hippie style. Uh, modern references have been interpolated, such as the Imperial March from Star Wars playing when a diabolical character enters, along with other songs from the 60s and 70s at key moments. Kensington Town Hall, used by many different community groups, was transformed with a multi-level set featuring an imposing court and a colorful forest. And it took careful planning and significant teamwork to install the large set in time for this rehearsal to begin. I also observed the daily fight call in which the fight director and involved actors carefully rehearse each step of each moment of stage violence and the fight director provided feedback to ensure the fight would be safely and consistently executed. Even prior to a public performance, the volunteer actors demonstrated a natural fluency and understanding with the tricky Shakespearean language. While the British Players has historically had an older core of volunteers, this production features many actors under 30 in important roles. As You Like It is a straight play, which historically have had lower ticket sales than their pantomime, music hall, and musical theater programming. However, Shakespeare is an important part of British theater history, and thus the British players have prioritized including Shakespeare in their holistic season of offerings. In a society where conflicts can seem irresolvable and obstacles insurmountable, the British players have constructed a world where radically different individuals can come together, sort out their issues, and find peace and love as the Woodstock era so vividly imagined. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, Amanda, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. For strategic planning, they look ahead two years within the organization, but not publicly. Their season is a spring play, a musical or music hall show in June, and a pantomime or panto at the holidays. They're working on growing and diversifying, diversifying the attendance, increasing school audiences, holding socials or event nights, and informal socials like bar nights. Constituent involvement stems from more than just unpaid production positions. More than 3,800 people are on a mailing list are and are notified of productions and encouraged to get involved or audition. Anyone can sign up for front of house positions and some join the play reading committee. Also teens and then often their parents participate via student service learning or SSL hours needed for graduation. The welcoming and fun atmosphere mean that many constituents uh, volunteer and or join as a member for $25 which includes a free ticket and discounted invitations to social events. The British Players is expanding its economic and racial diversity with the students participating in SSL hours, as well as school outreach. They gave away a large number of tickets to Title I middle schoolers and were expecting many, but only a few showed up. They are looking to perhaps provide buses or transportation next time. They are also working on inviting students from a local diverse high school and hosting a Q&A afterwards. When asked about goals and values, they provided these. Diversity, to bring in more diverse plays, audience, and members. Engagement, to grow membership and keep members active. Longevity, including board succession. Board retreat, an annual get together to review board roles, committees, team building, organization, and clarity. Community building, being a warm, welcoming, hospitable place where folks have a good time and take care of each other, then remain in touch. Regarding diversity or social issues, they are looking at more diverse material or topics such as colonialism or social ju justice and playwrights of color for feature slots. But as a community theater, they also have concern about finding a director to take on the work. They have never excluded anybody or any playwright before on the basis of race, color, creed, et cetera. Thank you. Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. I also had a very long, um, very detailed conversation with uh, these folks. And one of the things that I just want to make uh, clear about the membership, because I um, was a little concerned about the membership um, and that it's like a, that it would be a pay to play sort of thing. Um, but the 25, they, they were encouraging people to join as members and the $25 membership fee does get you a ticket, which is equal to, if not more worth than $25. Um, and it also gets you invitations to their events and things. So they are, um, it's kind of like, almost uh, like almost like a ticket voucher at that point. Um, and it's a, a nice way to get people in the door, I, um, I think, to be involved in their um, organization. Um, in regards to the diversity and social issues, um, I, I feel like they could take a wider range of looking at what sorts of plays or playwrights 
or topics they might cover. Um, it, they said that it was very easy. I'm trying to find my exact note on it, but they said it's very easy when you're talking about British um, plays and British material to get sort of without meaning to, to sort of cycle in within the same certain repertoire over and over and over again. And that they, if they had omitted anything in the past, it was, an, it was, or if they'd left anybody out in the past, it was an omission that was sort of just because they hadn't been intentionally including those different audiences and bringing them in. And so now that they're more aware and they are working really hard on trying to widen that circle, um, I think that they will do better at finding other ways to uh, be more diverse with the playwrights or the plays or the the people that are involved. Um, and I think that uh, they need not worry that if they seek out a certain play and if they look through the right channels that they will find the directors who will want to do those works. I just want to say, I heard you say that they gave tickets out to young people but they they didn't come that that for them to just to be mindful of the socioeconomic situation of those students that if, if you're going to give a ticket you've got to get them there they don't they don't necessarily they can't drive their parents are working two and three jobs that 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 needs to all you know be in in the same vein and regarding the directors there there are plenty of directors that can that are out there. Uh, I don't know, you know, what their methods are of, of reaching out outside of, you know, whom they know, but there are plenty of directors out there that can handle that kind of work and, and do Black British plays or whatever. Totally. And I, um, I was encouraging them to that, you know, uh, similarly, um, one thing that they did say about the uh, school groups was that they did ask, um, they, they had worked with the school and handed out a bunch of tickets. Um, but they, I think they did find that uh, transportation was the the barrier um, because middle schoolers just really can't get themselves anywhere. Um, so they are looking at transportation in the future. They are also working with um, they're looking at working with a local high school, Albert Einstein High School. Uh, apparently it's a very diverse high school. I'm not familiar with the area, but it's within like a five minute space, uh, you know, distance of where their theater is located. And high schoolers are also a little bit more um, able to make their way there. So I think that they were working on trying to create a, a partnership with that high school and work with them. Uh, but they are also looking at finding ways to make the middle school collaboration work. And we've cycled around this, but I found it so helpful to hear Amanda's um, explanation of the ways that the organization is looking at um, social justice issues, looking at diversity. But I want to overtly recommend to the organization that their narrative would be much more strong if there was very specific information about what about diversity and social issues that they're looking to incorporate. And I think without it, they incompletely demonstrate their public value and their plans to reach um, constituents. They, I think it. Um, I would recommend that it's really driven home with um, much more specificity. Thank you, panelists. That's four minutes. Thank you. Laura, as a staff discipline expert, do you have any additional information to share? Yeah, just a few notes. Um, great conversation, panelists. Thank you so much. And I, I did get some clarity on some of my questions too through your conversation. Um, sort of related to what you just said, Pam, I, I you know, they did mention in their application that while they are British and focused on British topics and themes, they very much recognize the need to address racism and social justice as a whole, that it's not just a US issue, but a worldwide issue. Um, so it seems like that is, you know, showing up in many different places throughout the organization as they're making those considerations. Um, there, there was the mention, Amanda, um, you know, illustrated the different long term goals um, that they're, you know, thinking about and working through. Um, I, it doesn't seem like there is a fully realized strategic plan in place. So it seems like there's lots of elements of it, though. So it might be time to actually put those things into place so that there is that formalized plan, you know, and thinking about what those long term goals are and then the subsequent strategies and benchmarks to achieve those. 
Um, there seems to be an overall awareness of demographics and where they are falling short currently. And that too could play into, you know, that long-term planning and, you know, how to think about those, those goals to, to achieve, achieve those different demographics. Um, and the, the application talked about this, Amanda talked about this, you know, the, the mission of the organization is to present British playwrights and plays. Um, that that's a wide swath of different playwrights. Um, so definitely, you know, I would encourage the organization to keep considering um, how all of the British playwrights show up. So, you know, seeking black British playwrights, of which there are many, um, you know, there seems to be more intentionality about that now, which Amanda spoke to. So I would encourage them to just continue down this road um, and thinking about ways that British plays uh, show up in the in the wider repertoire. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, is, click complete. Is there a way that I can clarify one thing that Laura just said? Um, Unfortunately, yeah, the discussion period is done, so um, we can't take any more uh, comments. However, Amanda, if you wanted to insert a clarifying note within the notes of your rubric uh, that would be great and um, we'll be able to see that there all right um all right uh so if you could panelists um log into smart simple and when you are finished click complete we'll take three minutes to do so now And the average final score is 76%. Please open application from the Everyman Theater, application ID 2024-17569. 
the average initial score is 96%. The panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, Amanda, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. I attended the play The Sound Inside <clears throat> by Adam Rapp at the Everyman Theater in the Bremer Arts and Entertainment District in downtown Baltimore. The show is a contemporary two-hander, one-act straight play. It is a suspenseful mystery focusing on Ivy League creative writing professor Bella, ba Bella Baird and her enigmatic standoffish freshman student, Christopher, and the intense ways that their lives intertwine. The play was part of the main stage theatrical season as their fifth of seven productions, starring two of their resident company actors, as well as a resident fight and intimacy director. I agree with the application that the costs are affordable and financially accessible, especially since there are a variety of price points for every performance, including eight pay-what-you-choose seats called 8 and A. The entire final dress rehearsal is also designated as a general admission pay-what-you-choose performance. My experience supported their application content, including their mission statement, and values of people, community, and excellence. These values were even directly addressed on signage inside of the bathroom stalls. The Everman clearly takes pride in their people and the community with large headshots of the resident company on display and volunteers in prominent front of house positions. Artwork displayed and on sale near the basement bathrooms also showed their commitment to community since the art from a local artist was on sale for very reasonable prices with 60% of the sale going directly to the artist and 40% to the Everyman, half of which went to educational initiatives. Regarding the value of excellence, the show itself was a truly professional production in both performances and stunning design, perhaps even better than when I saw the same play on Broadway in October 2019. Thank you. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, David, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Thank you, Kathy. For my in-depth conversation with the Everyman Theater, I met with Vinnie Lanchisi, Artistic Director, Marissa LaRose, Managing Director, and Elliot Kashner, Institutional Giving Manager. In a challenging landscape, every man has remained focused on how to best be of service to the community. They've given deep consideration to different methods to reach yet to be known constituents, including marketing and more and different publications, devising marketing plans specific to each show, and empowering audience members to serve as ambassadors. They understand that while offering programs like Pay What You Can helps reduce some barriers, they need to continue to be attentive to the ways that they can be both affordable and welcoming to all audiences. To better appeal to new audiences and distinguish their work, they've placed a greater emphasis on new works and works by underrepresented playwrights. Season planning is led by the artists, and they listen closely to feedback on productions and activities, both from candid conversations and formal surveys. Artistic ideas stem from the relationships that they've built, and team members seek to be accessible and open to good ideas wherever they come from. While all four artistic team members contribute curatorially, they each bring pers different perspectives and networks. Each of the three part-time associate artistic directors play a role in identifying and developing new works. They each have a distinct job description reflecting their specialties, and they work both within and outside Everyman to steward their industry connections. Tweety Found's folks include writing, literary management, and performing. Paige Hernandez has performed and directed at Everyman and provides insight into education, anti-racism, and equity. Noah Himmelstein is primarily a director and has experience with design. Together, they contribute to Everyman's ability to deliver on its mission to provide transformative and professional theater experiences. Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. Panelists, any additional questions, comments, recommendations?
If not, Laura, as the staff discipline expert, do you have any additional information to share? Well, thank you, Amanda and David, for that very thorough overview. Um, just a few additional things to to add in. Um, I found uh, this overall to be a, a very clear, very thorough application. Um, there are very clear mission and values and overall description of the organization and its functions. Um, as I think David uh, talked about a little bit, there's been an intentional shift in focus to new play development and especially reflecting lived experiences of local communities. So I think that that's a really exciting thing that's happening. Um, there's also uh, a changing focus away from subscription uh, retention to new single ticket acquisitions as well. Um, an ad hoc sustainability committee has been formed for the interim long term planning of the organization um, with everything that happened during the pandemic. A formal strategic plan just didn't seem possible at that point. So the organization needed to stay flexible. So this is uh, seeming to serve in that kind of interim capacity. Um, they've also done some work in the staffing structure and streamlined and clarified leadership structure by adding a new senior role, the senior director of advancement, which is overseeing all communications and revenue production. Um, there's a very clear description of the annual budgeting process and also very clear awareness of their demographics and where they might be falling short. Um, there's steps that are being taken to address all forms of diversity, including greater awareness of accessibility for those with disabilities. Um, I think my overall recommendation would just be to further consider how voices from outside the organization, so non-staff, non-board, non-audience members are being incorporated into the decision-making process, really thinking about how you're reaching those that are not currently engaged with the organization and incorporating that into the decision-making process as a whole. Thanks so much. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Symbol in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now. And the average final score is 97%. All right, panelists, it's break time. Um, we just have three more applications to go. So we're just gonna take a five minute break as scheduled, um, and then we'll come back to complete those three final applications. So we'll see you back at 1.55.
All right, panelists, it's 1.55. Pam, Vicki, David, Amanda, we are all here and ready for the next review. Panelists, please open application from the New Town Players, application ID 2024-17597. The average initial score is 79%. The panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, David, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Thank you, Kath. I attended a performance of The Sound of Music, one of the main stage shows produced by the Newtown Players. The Newtown Players is the only community theater in St. Mary's County in Southern Maryland. While The Sound of Music is best known for its acclaimed film, uh, the stage production places an increased focus on the distressing history of Austria in the years leading up to World War II. There's additional dialogue in which characters comment on current events and a song that was not included in the film that directly comments on the seeming inevitability of the Anschluss, in which the captain pledges to resist the rise of Nazi Germany against the advice of his friends. The show takes place nearly a century ago, yet the conversations ring sadly true today as discrimination and prejudice continue to adversely affect our society. On a lighter note, in this production, there were also many family connections within the cast, with several of the actors playing the Von Trapp children being the children of other adult actors. This contributed to a feeling of the show being a celebration for and by the community. This production was a clear example of quality entertainment that also provides artistic opportunities for the members of the Newtown Players to grow. The two leads in particular were trained and talented artists, and the Newtown Players provide them with a space to practice their craft and share it with the public. There's clearly demand for theater programming in St. Mary's County, given the entirely sold out run for the production. A musical of this type demonstrably appeals to a wide demographic and was appropriate for all ages. It appealed to both those who enjoy the sweetness of a classic Roger than Hammerstein musical, to those who seek art that allows them to reflect on serious issues affecting our lives. As a result, the production lived up to Newtown Players' promise to bring the community together into an intimate and historic space to foster and promote public knowledge and appreciation of arts and culture. Thank you. The panelists that helped the in-depth conversation, David, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. For my in-depth conversation with Newtown Players, I met with Robin Finnecom, treasurer, Jay Meisinger, Artistic Director, Stacey Park, Vice President, and Sarah Gravel, Production Chair. Like many community theaters, the theater has volunteer members organized into several committees that each manage a specific element of the theater's day-to-day -day work and budget, while the board is the governing body responsible for the organization's success. The committee council is made up of the chairs of each committee to regularly report on the activity and ensure transparency. For example, while the board approves and closely monitors the budget for productions, the production committee would determine the dates and times for the season calendar, and those would be communicated to the, community council, to the committee council to surface any issues. While the mission has remained consistent in the past two years, the pivot to remote operations required creative approaches and resulted in an increased focus on education. Their work with the school system, other theater groups, and other community groups led to podcasts, workshops, and other remote programs that built support and love for theater. They also strove to invest more deliberately in their diversity, equity, and inclusion work by refining their DEI practices, ensuring performances are accessible to all, and fostering community where all people are accepted. I would encourage Newtown players to consider potential metrics and formal tracking to assess how their investments affect the composition of their community and the accessibility of their work going forward. They've also sought to open up their season selection process. Rather than an exclusive play reading committee, anyone is welcome to volunteer to read and review prospective shows and submit reports for the consideration of the production committee. The production committee then ensures there's a good balance of shows to meet all their seasonal needs. The result is a theater that provides memorable and meaningful experiences for the community, in the community, and by the community all at once. Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. David, did you have an opportunity to talk with them? I had noticed that the DEI committee and the season selection committee were excluded from the staffing structure that was in the narrative. Did they talk at, at any great length about how they fit into the structure and the reporting relationship? Much? Sure, and they talked a little bit about that, but each of those did, the chairs of each of those committees, I believe, also served on that committee council. 
uh, for them to be regularly surfacing their work, being able to provide recommendations for the organization overall, and then being able to, a uh, DI committee also had to serve direct relationship to the board, not necessarily mandating the board, but being able to provide recommendations to improve the organization's overall operations. The play reading committee generally is uh, not reporting to the production committee, but their work is not, it's less of a formal play reading committee and then more of us a volunteer group. Uh, individually reviewing plays uh, potential for uh, potentially to be produced and the playing uh, uh, production committee being the ultimate uh, source of ensuring that the group of potential plays under consideration is a diverse uh, slate thank you david did they um did they address the staffing and how it reflects the population um in the geographic area um their answer in the um, application is very long and thorough, but doesn't actually have any demographics. It's a really good question. And they are very cognizant of the fact that it needs to be an area of focus. It's an, an area where they have to have growth. Um, they've taken some steps, including having the statement, having the committee, and now they're in the step where they have to be thinking about actualizing that. And so some of that is they haven't been collecting data to be able to understand if and how they are uh, uh, representing or reflecting their uh, community in the geographic area of surface uh, service in a really uh, substantial way. Um, so, and they are seeking to ensure accessibility to be improved uh, by improving, especially uh, specific people with handicapped accessibility, making their space better uh, acclimated for that. Um, but no, it, specifically in terms of racial age diversity, that isn't something they've been actively tracking. It's something that they know isn't going to be an important thing going forward, but they, they don't have uh, tangible data to reflect on at the moment. Great. I'm um, sort of piggybacking off of you. You're saying that they know that these are things that they are goals and that they want to work on. Do they have other information that they wanted to provide about vision statement or goals and values that are specific to, um, you know, what the, where they are or how they have evolved over the last couple of years? Absolutely. And so it's an exciting idea that they began as a group of community members and then they received this space that they are able to use full time. And so having have received that from, I believe it was the county that had gifted that space to them, they were then able to uh, use that space for a lot of different variety of programs. And so the vision is to be a source of arts and culture for this community where they, they're the only source of theater programming. And some of that involves like physically at the building. Some of that involves their outdoor programming out in the community that has gotten a lot of excitement and sort of becomes these really community gathering events. And so I think the vision that they were describing was a place where people come together more than just, uh, you know, knowing that the arts are there for the community, but uh, really to inspire that love, inspire that appreciation. And their goals being both sort of bringing new people in, bringing, uh, the people from across St. Mary's County and the surrounding counties to their location, um, but also being able to do so in a way that uh, fulfills their values and fulfills their, uh, how they value uh, diversity, equity, inclusion, as well as to be able to take these talents that people have in the community and be able to showcase them in a really great way. Thank you, panelists. That's four minutes. Thank you. Laura, as a staff discipline expert, do you have any additional information to share? Just a very few things. David, thank you so much for that thorough report. Um, I, I did just want to highlight, as David mentioned, you know, this is an organization that is primarily focused on Southern Maryland. And it's important to point out that they're serving a community that doesn't have a lot of other theater uh, outlets or organizations. So they're certainly filling a need in that community. And I think that's clearly felt, um, <clears throat> excuse me, in evidence through the sold out run of Sound of Music that David spoke about. So clearly they are you know, reaching that community. Um, there's a, a broadening scope to include the consideration of newer plays and playwrights, and they're connecting further and further with community partnerships and events. Um, they received a lot of feedback during their 2021 strategic planning efforts. And from this, the DEI committee was chartered. <laughs> Excuse me. Um, it sounds like a lot of that strategic plan has really been addressed. So I think, you know, now it's kind of what's next, you know, what what's going to come out of, you know, what's kind of strategic plan 2.0 for them, um, you know, and thinking about what that that's going to look like. 
<clears throat> um, they mentioned a challenge of having a few people do too much work and that they're seeking different models to make this a more sustainable thing for the organization. Um, I think that's a really important consideration. And, you know, that's also a great opportunity to allow more voices to be brought to the table while you're thinking about how to, you know, incorporate more people into the organization. Um, I really appreciate all of their care and their code of conduct that they talked about. They require a signature from everyone. Um, I would recommend that they consider um, some methods to diversify their income streams. They're heavily dependent on ticket sales, so that might be something to consider in a future strategic plan. Um, I would encourage them to further um, consider steps and plans to more accurately reflect the demographics of the community with the organization. There seems to be steps in progress, which, uh, which David spoke to, um, but to keep going down that road and to really thinking about how, how uh, the community at large is represented in their programming choices. Thanks so much. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now. And the average final score is 82%. I just wanted to note for any observers who are joining us, welcome. I just wanted to remind you to please remain on mute. And also, if you could turn your videos off, that would be great. Thank you. Next, please open application from Vagabond Players, Inc. Application ID number 2024-17766. The average initial score is 86%. The panelist that conducted the artistic activity visit, Amanda, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. I attended the complete works of William Shakespeare abridged at Vagabond Players nestled in the historic area of Fells Point in Baltimore for a great introduction to the cobblestone waterfront neighborhood. It does what the title says by comedically condensing lengthy plays and sonnets by the bard. Both highbrow and lowbrow, it has something for everybody. Rap, stage combat, vaudeville style scenes, and shtick. 
It culminated with a version of Hamlet fueled by audience participation. To my delight or dismay, I was pulled up on stage to represent Ophelia's angst with a scream. The three person cast did their own version of Hamlet and kept speeding it up to great comedic effect. They had a wonderful set and a plethora of props and quick changes and overall a lovely theater space. Their lobby had several large posters featuring production shots from the last hundred years and there was a nice history in the program and online. The show is a pure comedy as part of the six play season. In line with the chart of activities, it delivered artistic excellence in all aspects, including acting and design. As described in the chart, they offer very affordable ticket pricing and have discounts for students, seniors, military, and healthcare workers. As a comedy meant to offer entertainment and escape, this show was not the type to cha challenge the audience with interpersonal, political, or social issues as described in the application, but it has its place and did its function well. Though the application speaks to diversity efforts, this show did not have a diverse playwright. It was created by three white men from the Reduced Shakespeare Company, and it featured three a three-person white cast. However, the next show slated is The Mountaintop by a black female playwright with two black characters, which speaks to a balanced season. The play I saw was in line with their creative process. It was a, com a comedy with a small cast and relatively simple production values or requirements. The artistic activity was in line with their hope for the sensory or emotional experience, quote, an opportunity to allow people to take a few hours, put their life on hold and consider the experiences of others and be touched by humanity or humor. Thank you. Thank you. The panelists that held the in-depth conversation, David, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Thank you, Kat. For my in-depth conversation with Vagabond's players, I met with Stephen Dininger, the board member. They are excited to partake in a formal strategic planning process this summer when the production schedule is lighter. This will be an opportunity to codify their values, build consensus on the organizational direction, and set goals in a more formal way than they have ever done before. Established 107 years ago, they are committed to being a part of upbuilding their neighborhood and creating a resilient organization. And they carefully look at the, I look carefully at past show budgets and their balance sheet to build each year's budget. Finances are reviewed by board members on a monthly basis, which has been so important as conditions have changed and evolved. Like many organizations, there's been significant turnover in their membership. So recruitment will be a big focus in the coming years. Over the past two years, expanding their membership and ensuring all positions are accessible have been top priorities. This has brought fresh and helpful perspectives to the table. While the committee that reviews submissions makes the ultimate decisions for the shows that will be presented, community members have multiple opportunities to share their views, including via surveys of audiences and frequent conversations with prospective and past directors, including people who participated in past productions. Part of their strategy has been to expand their canon beyond shows and playwrights to which their audience is already accustomed. This can be a challenge, but rewarding too, and providing variety in the types of shows they present will attract new audiences and participants alike. Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. David, was there a way that um, you might elaborate on the constituent involvement? You said that they have conversations with people that are surveys and things, and can you, can, can you Elaborate further. Yeah, and so I mean, the, the most formal, the broadest, is the surveys that they do. They regularly understand what audience members are looking for. Um, some of it also comes from actively speaking with people who've directed in the past, people who performed in the past, as well as people who've expressed interest in directing and want to learn more. And some of that has come with including people as associate directors or assistant stage managers being able to provide them with the knowledge to be able to go into a, a room and be able to direct potentially for the first time in a really comfortable way. Those are all people that have a, definitely a significant influence on the season planning process because it's a volunteer organization. And so it's uh, they can come from sort of the general public as well as people who are interested but haven't already been a part of the organization. Do they tell you how they delivered those surveys? Um, I, I was just curious. I attended, and though obviously not as a typical patron, um, because I had my ticket arranged for me, um, but uh, I, I didn't see anything in particular about how one could fill out a survey or something like that. Sure. They hadn't mentioned this, the scheduling of the particular survey. I'm not sure when or how it goes. I would assume by email based on th their typical communication style. Um, but they didn't provide specifics around uh, when or how the surveys are issued.
were they able to um, indicate specifically what sort of process they'd like to do over the summer? Um, yeah, I believe uh, Six Sigma was the structure they were planning to use. This is a, a series of formal conversations, primarily focused with the board. They have the greatest time commitment, but incorporating other stakeholders to both sort of create a really broad idea of where they want to be going, what the next hundred years look like, I believe was a phrase used at one point, um, as well as being understanding what the individual steps are for the immediate future to get to the next level. Um, this is a more formal process than they've ever undertaken before. And so they want to understand, sort of get uh, start learning the ropes of that to be able to be consistently uh, reviewing strategic planning. Yes. And sorry to, I feel like I'm monopolizing, but just out of curiosity, did you speak with anybody else besides Steven? Or was uh, he was the only person I spoke with. Interesting. He um, was also in the show and he's on the board, um, but he was one of the three actors in the show specifically. So I get the sense that he does a lot um, and that perhaps a small but mighty board. It's true. And I believe he only joined the board last year. Um, and it's an interesting group because there, there are some who have been there with, involved with the organization for a very long time, as well as some new people who are going to be incorporated. Uh, and, and the, again, recruitment is going to be a focus. And that's part of uh, also just revitalizing that neighborhood that really was hit hard during the pandemic. Panelists, any additional questions, recommendations, thoughts? If not, Laura, as a staff discipline expert, do you have any additional information to share? Only a few brief things. Thank you so much, panelists, for that information. Um, I'm so glad to hear about the details about the strategic plan and that that's really kicking off in earnest this summer. Um, I think that'll be a really important thing for the organization, especially as, you know, as we're moving into this new phase of the pandemic. Um, I think that that will be something that's going to be really important to them. Um, I, I did uh, note in their application that they, um, they talked a little bit about noticing some shifts in buying patterns that they're they're seeing this shift from subscriptions to single tickets um and i just wanted to comment that that's a i think a great opportunity to consider how they are connecting with new audiences and there might be a really great way to start thinking about how they're reaching those that they're not currently serving and that might play into the strategic plan as well as that you know is developed over the summer um, they did note that they, they know that the board isn't fully reflective of the community that they serve. They strategically made the decision to first work on the diversity of their programming, which then they believe will impact the potential future pipeline of prospective board members. Um, and again, that might be something that is played into, um, you know, and examined a bit further in their um, strategic planning process. Um, I would also encourage the organization to think um, more holistically about their consideration of non-dominant norms. Um, instead of having an identified, they called it in the application, a provocative play, think about the ideas of non-dominant norms and narratives and how they're felt and considered throughout the season planning process as a whole. I, I think it's there a little bit more than what they're communicating in the response based on um, other responses in the application and also based on what Amanda and David are saying here today. Thanks so much. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now.
and the average final score is 88%. <clears throat> Next, please open application from Woomwork Productions, application ID 2024-18237. The average initial score is 90%. The panelists that conducted the artistic activity visit, Vicki, will now have two minutes to share any information gathered. Vicki, if you're speaking, we're unable to hear you. I'm so sorry. I contacted Executive Director David Fakunle to schedule a visit. Um, initially, we had some difficulty uh, arranging a date because some of the dates that I chose that were listed on their website as new generation meets their next generation meets their when I contacted him, they weren't actually meeting that day. So we had to select the 25th uh, and he advised me that the 25th would be an event celebration of their program and not a performance. However, uh, it would be a good time to meet other staff and they would have videos for me to see. So I arrived at Bon Secours Center. Um, I did see adults and children setting up for a party in one area. And I waited for um, Dr. Fakunle. He, I had to actually call him and he did arrive about 30 minutes late. When he got there, there were no um, womb, woman, womb, womb work staff to meet or videos for me to view. So I asked him to forward links, which he did um, about two days later. So I was able to view four short videos uh, showing next generation and new generation groups performing at Northeast Market. Uh, the text and the music of the performances related to empowerment and referenced black heroes and sheroes. Um, camera was close up on the children so I couldn't actually see the audience or the location. However, I was able to hear that the performances were well received. Um, Mr. Fakunli also sent a 2021 video uh, of the New World Art Ensemble, and those were young adults who were doing spoken word, drama, and dance. Uh, the productions were somewhat similar to school assembly type things, um, but the children and the young people involved were enjoying the experiences and audiences were enjoying the experiences um while thank I you, Vicky. that's two minutes thank you the panelists that held the in-depth conversation pam will now have two minutes to share any information gathered the mission of womb work productions is to provide healing for youth primarily black and brown youth and then by extension their families and communities womb work merges performing arts and cultural expression the organization is intentional about addressing the impact of relevant public health issues and improving social emotional health the organization has three ensembles youth teens and adults all present health issues and personal storytelling. David Fakunli has a background in public health and cultural context um, and believes that arts are beneficial to self-esteem uh, self -esteem and self-efficacy. Woomworth uh, work emphasizes the beauty of being a person of color, not being defined by trauma since there's so much more to explore. Woolworth is growing and professionalizing. It realized it's too impactful to be on a shoestring. The organization intentionally sought grant funding for resources. There is an evolution from a mom and pop organization to one with more structure. Executive Director David Fakunli and Chief Administrative Officer Doralee Calderon Fakunli are working on a part-time basis. They took over in early 2020. Last year, they officially became employees, the organization's first in 25 years, and now they're adding uh, additional staffing. The leadership evolution balances the skills of new input with institutional knowledge of those who've been part for a long time. Founders Mama Kay and Mama Rashida acknowledged that the transition needed to happen. They trusted David and Doralee who grew up within the organization. The events of 2020, specifically COVID and the death of George Floyd, changed the way Woomworks story has been received by funders. They've always emphasized social connection and creativity, but now people understood deeply and, and more fully. Events, are under, events underscored the importance of talking about race. It's not easy, but it's necessary. They're encouraging a lot of difficult conversations that people can digest with all the gravity it deserves. 
It's not a shaming session, but identifying ways to address systemic issues. Wombwork believes that change needs to begin with us, and the storytelling that Wombwork encourages helps process all that's happening. Thank you. Panelists, you now have four minutes for additional discussion. Vicki, please feel free to complete your thought there mm -hmm. if you'd like. Yes, I wanted to add that although I was unable to see anything live, I'm familiar with their work over the years and the impact that it has had in the community, not only with the young people, the children and the young people who participate and learn their culture and share their stories, but also how that is impacting communities outside of, of their own communities. Thank you, Vicki. And Vicki or, or Pam, can you speak a little bit more? Did they have uh, further insight on how they were reaching it to be known constituents? They have a, a significant new grant with um, Johns Hopkins to be doing ex existential determinants of health initiative. So the Johns Hopkins organization is bringing them to new constituents um, facing other areas of trauma and other um this this particular group they're working with are those who have dependency issues um so i think it's you know a lot of different types of community engagement um because in the very early years it was kind of word of mouth would would bring people into the organization Do you have more uh, clear explanation of long-term planning and how they specifically link to mission, vision, and goals? Uh, I think it's an evolving process because of the leadership, the, the new leadership changes. Um, uh, COVID uh, opened them up to doing more um, more work on camera, more remote kinds of work. So there's a there. I think um, integrating a lot of these opportunities that are new, both in the leadership front and kind of the technology or outreach front. Um, uh, and because uh, they're professionalizing the staffing and the time that they can spend, um, I think that also impacts what kind of time can go into long range strategic planning. Panels, any additional thoughts, questions, recommendations to share? If not, Laura, as a staff discipline expert, do you have any additional information to share? Just a few additional notes, and thank you so much, panelists, for, for that information. Um, you actually answered several of my questions as well. Um, I just wanted to note that the um, that WombWorks, their work utilizes performing arts and cultural expressions grounded in African and indigenous philosophies. They operate as a collective. Um, as I think Pam just mentioned, they've um, they've turned their focus um, largely to on uh, significantly to online programming, um, which I believe was a result of the pandemic. Um, they've acknowledged that there is a need for further expertise to join their staff as they move into this next phase of the organization to more effectively administer programs. Um, and there has been that leadership um, change, which Pam spoke to. Um, they're also re-examining the role of the board, and I would recommend that they prioritize this to make sure that there are really clear roles identified that are in support of the organization and its mission. Um, just in terms of that long-term planning, it seems like all of those things are kind of leading up to the need for some kind of um, long-term or strategic plan um, in a more formalized um, manner. So that might be something that they consider thinking about, um, you know, in, in the, the near future. 
Um, I did want to also just note this has no impact on scoring, um, but just after reading this application, the organization may consider um, shifting disciplines in the future to multidiscipline. Um, they appear to focus on on many different genres and not just theater, but also music and dance and some other mediums. So that's just something for consideration. Again, no impact on scoring at all, but something that we could talk about um, in the future if that made sense for the organization. Thank you. Based on the information gathered from the discussion, please take time now to adjust any of your scores and comments in Smart Simple in alignment with the rubric. When finished, click complete. We'll take three minutes to do so now. And the average final score is 91%. And that was our last application for review today. Thank you everyone so much for your time and thoughtfulness today. Uh, we want to note the importance of your role in this process. It's really critical to have you a part of this process and your expertise and recommendations are incredibly valuable. Thank you so much. Um, and also thanks to Bonnie and Shelley, our counselor monitors today. Uh, the, uh, the final average scores directly impact the funding for each organization. The funding formula takes the panel percentage score multiplied by the organization's allowable income and the cap allocation percentage, which is based on fiscal year 24 state funding to be determined to get to the final grant award recommendation. I'm also noting that the GFO program will be using an equitable funding formula in fiscal year 24. This will be the first year of a five-year transition period. So this will impact that cap allocation percentage based on the tier that the organization falls into. And that tier is determined by the organization's allowable income. For more information about this, visit the GFO page of the MSAC website or the FY24 GFO guidelines. Um, additionally, panelists' comments and recommendations are also provided to organizations that went through the full panel review process to ensure further transparency and encourage organizational sustainability. 
Grant award notifications that will be sent out in July will include a form for applicant organizations to fill out if they're interested in receiving that feedback. So this concludes the public, the public portion of the meeting. Uh, panelists, if you could just hang on for a tight minute.